to the conduit. It is Tuesday, January 10. It's 4 p.m. in the state of Washington. Uh, tonight, we are going to be airing uh, the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Uh, I and several other people will be testifying uh, this evening. <clears throat> As I said to you before, it is important to make your voice heard. It's also important for you to advocate. And so I'm going to be more intentional about that this year. As I shared with uh, you, with you, with the conduits, we need a name, the conduits, uh, during my New Year's. Uh, broadcast. And so this is me being present, accountable, and not letting any moss grow underneath my feet. So this will start soon. As I said, uh, I know there are quite a few people, uh, I believe, from Kitsap County that are going to testify today, which is fantastic. Uh, I will be also testifying tomorrow. And I believe twice on Thursday. So I'm going to be tremendously busy here. <clears throat> what I hope that you can take from this experience is one, uh, gaining an interest and insight. You know, many of us <laughs> are going to turn on C-SPAN or kind of look at these things. Uh, but <coughs> you probably heard. All right, members, let's call the January 10th meeting of the Ways and Means Committee to order. We have 163 people signed in, signed in wishing to testify, so I want to get things going. Um, welcome to everybody. Before we start the committee um, business for the day, which is a hearing on the governor's budget, um, I would like to ask members to go around and introduce themselves because we have a bunch of new faces on our committee. And so if, if we could start maybe with uh, Senator Schessler, just who you are and your name and your district or where you live. Mark Schessler, uh, 9th Legislative District, Ritzville, Sharecropper. <laughs> Yep. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Chris Gildon, Senator for the 25th District, which is centered in Puyallup. And welcome to our committee. Good afternoon. I am Linda Wilson. I am from Clark County, and I now represent all of Skamania County as well, and that's the 17th Legislative District. And I'm Christine Rolfes from North and Central Kitsap County. June Robinson, 38th District, Everett, Marysville. Hi there, Andy Billig. I represent the Lilac City of Spokane. <laughs> Mark Muller from Issaquah. Good afternoon. Just got my internet back. Karen Kaiser, 33rd District. That means Kent, Des Moines, SeaTac, Burien, a little bit of federal. Uh, Pasagawa, 11th Legislative District, which is South Central King County. State Senator Steve Conway, representing the 29th Legislative District at South Tacoma, Parkland, and Spanaway. Senator Lisa Wellman from the 41st Legislative District. I live on Mercer Island. I'm Senator Joe Wynn from the 34th Legislative District, which is Seattle. And if you've gone to the Seahawks game, you're in the district. Hi, everyone. It's State Senator Matt Binky from the Mighty 8th District out of Kennewick, Pasco, Richland, the Tri-City area. It's happy to be here. Hey, Senator Ron Mazal, 10th Legislative District. John Braun, the State Senator for the 20th District, so just south of Olympia to just north of Vancouver, I-5 to White Pass. Judy Warnick, State Senator from the 13th District, most of Grant County, all of Kittitas County, and a good portion of Yakima County. Good afternoon, Nikki Torres with the 15th Legislative District. 
Keith Wagoner, representing the 39th Legislative District, parts of Skagit and Snohomish County. I reside in Cedar Woolley. Good afternoon, Rebecca Saldana, State Senator of the 37th Legislative District. Senator Wynn, of course, is highlighting the part of the, the 37th that he inherited from us with the stadiums, but I do still represent Central District, International Chinatown, Rainier Valley, and Skyway, which is part of unincorporated King County. <coughs> Kevin Van de Wagen, Olympic Peninsula. Good afternoon, Manka Tingra, State Senator from the 45th Legislative District, which is parts of the city of Redmond, Kirkland, Sammamish, and Duval. Sam Hunt, 42nd District, you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you members. We're gonna do a full staff introduction next Thursday or this coming Thursday when we have more time. Um, and with that, we, I want to say we have a very full agenda today for everyone watching or in the meeting. This audio will be recorded. The meeting's viewable live on TVW, and then it's viewable after that. We're going to experiment. This is the first meeting I've done a hybrid where some of our testifiers are online and some are in person. And so for that reason, we are going to go in the order in which people signed up and just go back and forth online or in person. So we'll be calling, if you're online, um, the staff will pull you into the meeting uh, a little bit ahead of time so you have some preparation. If you're here in person, we'll do it the traditional way where, where we'll call you up a few at a time and um, um, get people sorted through that way. The members and staff can access meeting materials in the EBB and the public can see um, the, the documents, which in this case are the budget um, on the committee's webpage. So what we are going to do is Senator Robinson is going to be calling out people's names. We are allowing one minute for oral testimony. If you have things in writing, um, please submit them and we'll distribute them and get them into the record. And um, with the one exception, we're going in line. And that exception is that um, following the bill sponsor, Mr. Schumacher's presentation, when we open up the public hearing, we'll be starting with the state auditor, Pat McCarthy. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask you, David, to come to the front and give us your presentation. And while you're getting, while we're getting you set up, um, I just got a note from our uh, committee um, coordinator that materials from the public can be submitted. They need to be submitted electronically. You're no longer able, if you're here in person, to um, hand them your materials. Please submit it electronically. All right, David, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you, Chair Rolfes and members of the committee. It is always nice to be back in this room. Um, especially nice now that we're all in person. So thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the, the major points of the governor's budget. Um, I think we have sent along the highlights of the governor's budget. Um, we have rec sums, we have the budget bill. So if there are questions, there will be things that I'm sure we don't get to here today. Um, you know, your staff is well informed about all of this, but you can always ask me or my staff if there's things that you need more information about or things you'd like to dive deeper on. So please always feel free to ask, you know, both this week and as we get going in session. I'm thinking, okay. So um, just a little high level in, in putting this budget together. Obviously we're coming from a period where we had an awful lot of federal money where this is kind of a transition budget as we transition out of a significant amount of federal money into a relatively slow growing economy, a growing economy, but, but not growing the way that it was. Um, fortunately, we had money in reserve with the four year outlook, you'll see that we're able to spread the reserves across the period as we kind of move from you know, the COVID and crisis and federal money period back to a more normal, natural situation. Um, one of the things that, that was a real focus in this budget were the recruitment and retention problems that we've had across state government 
for the last several years. Um, as we began developing this budget last summer, the, the number one, I think from every agency director, maybe not every, but the overwhelming number was they were asking for help with recruitment and retention, that that was their first and foremost priority. So you'll see in this budget that that is, is a big focus. And beyond that, our thinking was to try not to start a lot of new things and to kind of stabilize things that we had already started and were in process. So you'll kind of see those themes as, as we move through. So just in big terms, the governor's budget is a little over $70 billion. Obviously most of that, like it always is, is in K-12, still well over, over $30 billion. I think the more interesting slide is the next one, which shows the growth in the budget by these same categories. And you'll see the, the biggest part of the budget, which again is no surprise. I mean, the K-12 is by far the biggest part that we have in the budget. It's still over $3 billion larger than in the underlying budget. But you'll see in social and health services, healthcare authority, DCYF, significant investments um, and, and that a lot of that will show up in um, workforce will be part of the collective bargaining agreements that that will be before you in this budget. So of the major um, priorities in the governor's budget, um, number one we'll see is a focus on homelessness and housing supply uh, you probably heard that the governor is proposing a referendum on homelessness and housing. I think we'll probably deal with that a lot more on Thursday as part of the capital budget, budget conversation. But in both cases, we'll talk about operating and capital together whenever we talk about these housing homelessness um, efforts, because it's always a, a combination of of the buildings and the services um, to have any kinds of success. So here, when you see the 1.3 billion, this is both operating and capital. Um, and again, of uh, the governor's uh, $4 billion referendum, I was planning to discuss more and take questions more on Thursday as part of the capital budget and how, how that works. So then within the, what I would think of the, the regular part of the budget, right? The referendum is kind of its own funding source. We'll get to the Climate Commitment Act, which has its own funding source. The biggest thing in the, the core of the budget in terms of bigger than it would typically be is behavioral health. And this runs from, you know, more beds, higher rates, um, you know, capacity and rates. Um, we've got, you know, clip facilities. We've got True Blood. You know, there's investments throughout the system um, to address our behavioral health issues in this state. This is a real core um, spending priority in the governor's budget. Then the K-12 one of the larger investments is the continued, continued, the continued, it's spring training for me too. Um, it's continuing the social emotional support hiring that we continue to ramp up within our schools. On top of that, a significant increase in special ed and K-12 compensation. In early learning, we have made a significant proposal to increase the rate uh, school and working day slots of 40%. Um, this is just one of the more extreme examples where the workforce, we have not been able to find the workforce to do the, uh, the tasks, the jobs that, that, that we need. So that's a significant increase, um, certainly compared to most of the rest of the budget, but we think it's what, what is required. 
so then just in general, state, like I said, state agencies across the board have faced a significant recruitment and retention difficulty. Um, what we've did in the collective bargaining for state employees in general was a 4% and a 3% raise. But we did what we did in specific, there were a lot more targeted spending in this um, collective bargaining agreement than is typical. Um, you know, for example, you know, nurses. So nurses had much higher than a 4% and a 3%. And then, for example, nurses on, on weekends or overtime shifts or for a, a number of situations will be well, well above 4%. Um, across the board, people in the, our institutions, in the 24-7 institutions, would, will be getting, if the collective bargaining is passed, um, significantly more than the, the four and the three. The four and the three is kind of the headline maybe that, that people know about, but the targeted in some cases are much higher than that. Just to give a little history of bargaining, um, you know, the light blue at the end shows the four and a three. You'll remember in the last two years, it was a zero. It was actually a zero and a three and a quarter, if I remember. So that's not, that's rounded off a little bit. Um, you'll remember that two years ago, the what we negotiated, what the governor's office negotiated with labor was based on the idea that our economy was crashing and we had to save money and we negotiated furloughs and budget cuts and freezes, and that never happened. But the first year of that biennium ended up with state employees getting no raise, and then in the second year of the three and a quarter. So the you can get a sense for you know how things have gone these last several years. So then we move to the climate and the Climate Commitment Act, where we have um, new revenue that will start coming in in February. Um, these numbers, the revenue numbers, are all based on on estimates of what will start coming in in February. I would imagine, even though all of our revenue that we use for anything is based on estimates, the fact that this is the first time that these revenues will come in, will make this maybe a little bit more volatile at first. But we have used the official ecology forecast and built a budget around that. Um, in the Climate Commitment Act revenues, we have $365 million. You'll also find money in the capital budget. You'll find money in the transportation budget. Some of this is driven by statute. Some of this is driven um, like by category, so I think as as we go through the session, you you will you will see there are some parameters around how this money can be spent. It's it it has to be mostly spent in the climate world, but the specific things, for example, that we chose are not exactly the specific things that the legislature has to follow. As much as my boss might like that to be the case. Oops, went the wrong way. Um, in addition, we're proposing a significant uh, set of, of ideas around restoring salmon. I think the biggest one of these is, is a voluntary incentive program around riparian, um, uh, riparian decisions around creeks, rivers, et cetera. Um, I know in the past there's been some controversy about that, but what we are looking for this year is voluntary incentives to try to, to improve uh, water quality, water temperature, et cetera. And then I have a couple slides just to address a couple points that I've had questions uh, between the time that our budget came out and now that I thought that maybe a picture or two would help. One of the things that we did to save money in this budget is we, I think we all knew in the last couple of years that 
PERS 1 and TERS 1, the unfunded liability was about to be paid off. We've been paying this off to the tune of several hundred million dollars for 25 years, maybe now. And we were about to the end of it. The legislature set aside $800 million for that. Since um, that decision was made, it also looks like we can stop the spending into the account and still have over 100% funded plans in both the PERS and the TERS. So if I could take a second just to show the, the first line, the top line over on the left, this is the PERS, that if we did nothing, the, the PERS one would be over 140% funded. Under our plan, it will still be over 100% funded the similar logic on the TERS, the question why, well, why would you do this? Well, it's, it's well over a billion dollars in savings and the plans are still fully funded. So this was, this was a significant savings um, idea that you'll find in our budget. Um, one thing to point out, coming this year, uh, the Washington, working families tax credit will actually begin. This is another thing that folks have been working on for quite a while. It will provide up to $1,200 in tax relief for almost 400,000 families. Um, when it's up and running, it's, a, it's roughly $250 million per year. Um, again, since this is a new program, we will, we will know a lot more um, after the first year, just about what the size of this is and how many people will be impacted. But this is our current estimate, and these are the current numbers that are in our in our budget. And then finally, I think this is my last one, um, which I thought was interesting when my staff shared it with me, so I thought I would share it with you. The blue line, this goes back to 2010. The blue line shows the growth in the Washington economy the purple magenta, I don't know, line shows the growth in Washington state spending and the, you know, wiggles aside, what you basically see is that Washington state spending has grown roughly the same as the state's economy over that period. One, somebody up there is thinking, well, why did it go higher in 2023? And I, Maybe all of you are wondering why did it go higher in 2023? I certainly did when I saw this. Um, and the reason is you'll remember the $2 billion appropriation from the general fund to transportation. So that's what that little anomaly or hiccup in the data shows. So, I mean, you could pick different, different dates to start this, you know, farther back or less, but what you see, the, the basic idea is this, the growth in the state budget roughly follows the growth of the Washington state economy. With that, I'm happy to answer questions or get out of the way because I know you have a lot of people to come. David, thank you very much. That, um, you know, whether or not people like your budget, that's a tremendous amount of work. And I know <laughs> put months into that with a lot of staff. So thank you. And thanks for coming today and presenting it. Always happy to. I know that I saw Senator Conway's hand. I do want to limit questions, but we can take a couple. Oh, no. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Sir Conway, we'll talk with you offline. Thank you very happy, much. Happy, happy to talk. Thank you all. Now, I think you like to think of this as your job is done and then now it's our job, right? That's the, your official the, passing the budget. The, certainly the passing of the attention, which <laughs> I am delighted. All right. Thank you, David. Um, we are going to open the public hearing. As we go through, I want to remind people this was on our um, sign up page um, on the web, but I want to make sure we are hearing, technically hearing two budgets, the supplemental, the governor's supplemental budget, which covers um, 2023 through June. And we're also hearing the two-year biennial budget, which is what David Schumacher just presented. So if you had comments on both of those, please consolidate them into one set of comments. 
And we will begin with, with um, our statewide elected official, Pat McCarthy, our state auditor. Welcome to our committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, I am your state auditor, Pat McCarthy. Uh, and with me is Scott Nelson, my director of legislation and policy. Uh, I'm happy to be here mostly in support of the governor's budget for our auditing work. For this budget, we have two requests. It's important to note that neither request draws from the general fund. Both are funded by initiative 900 monies, the performance audit of government accounts. I do wanna thank the governor, his proposed budget fully funds our request to increase our cybersecurity efforts. That additional 2.9 million would accomplish several things. It would add up to 18 additional governments to our critical infrastructure cybersecurity project. This will expand work the legislature previously funded to review local governments that provide critical infrastructure, such as electrical or water service. Our budget request will also allow us to develop a new audit program intended to help governments that have been targeted by cyber attacks. In the last biennium, 60 local governments reported cyber attacks that resulted in a loss of public funds. Our program will review such incidents and include readiness audits to help local governments avoid losses to, by cyber criminals. Finally, our request would also expand our main cybersecurity audit program and augment our non-audit cyber support services through our Center for Government Innovation. That means more cybersecurity audits of local governments and more assistance for them as well. Our second request was funded at 50% in the governor's budget. I would like to encourage you to fully fund this request for 2.58 million in funding authority for additional performance audits. While our cybersecurity program is in high demand, so are our, 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 our traditional performance audits. Uh, recent performance audits, uh, you may remember, uh, revealed racial disparities in ballot rejection rates and recommended ways to improve customer service at the Employment Security Department. Our request would allow us to conduct four to six additional performance audits per biennium, enabling us to examine additional topics. The citizens intent in creating the performance audits fund was to improve gov government through independent audits. We think these requests are reasonable and well within the existing funds available to the performance audits of government account. Thank you, and I'm here to answer any questions but I see you have a full agenda. So yes, I thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that input. And we are generally not, out, we're not going to be asking any questions. No problem. Lots of people to run through, but everyone knows where to find you. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you thank for joining you. us. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are going to start going down the list, starting with uh, K-12 public schools. If you're here, please come forward when I call your name. Some people are in the room. Some people are remote. Melissa Gomboski, uh, Dr. Michelle Price, Dr. John Parker, Catherine George, Larry Delaney, Marissa Rathbone. Melissa, let's get started with you while we wait for the others to join you. Thank you, Chair Rolfus, honorable members of the committee. I'm Melissa Gomboski, pleased to be here today on behalf of Spokane, Evergreen, Vancouver, Richland Public Schools, as well as ESD 105 Schools Coalition. We very much appreciate the investments this budget makes in public education, specifically in special ed and raising the multiplier. Just in the interest of time, I'll jump to a couple um, places that we hope to see when you adopt your own budget where there would be more significant investments in public education. First is, of course, special ed. We'd like to see the each student multiplier for each student who has an IEP that expanded as well so we can serve all those students. And then finally, this budget does not address uh, our broken transportation system for pupil transportation. Uh, Senator Wellman has done a lot of work on this in the interim. It's a complex, complicated formula. It is based on funding the average um, 
transportation for uh, schools across the state, that means that half of our public schools are not adequately funded for our kids' transportation. So the most fundamental part of our school system is just getting to school. If you are in a family that has one car or single parent, you really need your school bus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Melissa. Staff, can we get uh, Dr. Price? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Right, fabulous. Good afternoon, Chair Ralphus and the honorable members of the committee. My name is Dr. Michelle Price. I serve as the superintendent of North Central Educational Service District in Wenatchee. I'm speaking today on behalf of the AESD network, which is all nine ESDs working together. We're grateful and appreciative of the K-12 investment in the budget before you, specifically the funding for updating the prototypical funding model for student support services. Last year, you adopted House Bill 1664, phasing in new support positions over three years. We appreciate seeing this commitment honored. Unfortunately, the needs of our youth around behavioral and mental health continue to be at crisis levels. For most districts, the funds from 1664 backfill positions. Our ESD network has used ESSER funds to deploy new direct services to 51 school districts across the state. Today, we're asking you to please um, provide this service and support by supporting the AESD um, request to continue and expand this critical service addressing the ongoing needs. Thank you. Dr. Price, thank you. You're our first hybrid testifier, so I wanna ask you, what do you see? All right, so I see our pictures. I see you, um, Chair Rolfus, and uh, now the full Senate. Uh, when it became, um, I think it was unclear when my turn would be other than hearing that I was second. Um, and I did see um, each of the other presenters uh, in the panel. Great, thank you for letting thank us know that. All right. Okay, we'll move on to Dr. John Parker, who is remote. Please go ahead. Hello, Chair Walfus and committee members. My name is John Parker and I serve as the superintendent for Central Valley School District on the east side of the state where we have about 16% of our students or 2,200 with individual learning plans. Our district greatly appreciates the investments made for students in public education and particularly in special education. This, in, this budget invests in funds to raise the cap on the number of students enrolled to 15% this is helpful. Our district is above the cap by 2.5% and we continue to refine and improve our process for identifying students. Uh, while raising the cap, we would really appreciate the real need for our students is raising the per student multiplier. This is the investment of the greatest benefit for Central Valley School Districts and many others. Currently, we pay 4.5 million out of our local levy to cover special education costs. So increasing the multiplier would lessen this burden on our local levy and free it up for other intended purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have Catherine George or she's not available? No, okay, we will move on then to Larry Delaney. Good afternoon, Chair Rolfus and committee. I'm Larry Delaney, president of the Washington Education Association. The WEA was disappointed in several aspects of the governor's budget. Uh, the governor's budget for educator wages that does not keep pace with rising inflation, eroding the competitiveness of educator pay. The governor's proposal fails to provide targeted increases for classified educators, the lowest paid K-12 workers. And districts will continue to struggle to hire and retain paraeducators, food service workers, bus drivers, and others, which ultimately impacts school operations and student learning. While we support the governor's interest in increasing special education funding, the governor's approach does fall short. We recommend increasing the special education multipliers, as well as increasing the enrollment cap. We do appreciate the governor's investment in workforce development and retention through residency programs and mentorship for early educators. WEA also appreciates the interest institutional support provided in higher education. Like in K-12, we recommend that your budget consider wage increases targeted addressing low-income wages, especially among part-time faculty. And we do look forward to continued budget discussions throughout the session. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa.
Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Marissa Rathbone. I'm the Director of Advocacy with the Washington State School Directors Association. Before I get started, I'll just uh, say thank you so much for hosting us and for having us here in person uh, while having to trade in heels uh, as opposed to house slippers. It's sure nice to be here with you. Um, we are grateful, like our education partners, that you have continued to invest in the public education system, most specifically last year on social-emotional learning staff, uh, as well as transportation reimbursements. Uh, that was a good start, and we want to continue along that trajectory. School board members last fall prioritized special education above any other issue, and we have many issues that we hope to address, but this is absolutely our number one, like our education partners. The governor's proposed budget addresses that them, but it doesn't go far enough. Uh, you've heard from several others already, and we'll continue to hear that we hope uh, continued conversations around increase or removing the cap, uh, as well as increasing the multiplier. Last thing I'll just say is that uh, there's a lot of conversation around the economy, public safety, social services. We absolutely agree those should be priorities of our state, and I would encourage you to think about how education bolsters all of those um, and prepares our future workforce and citizens to live in a healthy and safe environment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. We have three people who are remote next, but I would like to ask uh, Jenny Plaha, Jake Garcia, and Rick Chiza to come forward and be ready to testify. And we'll move on to John Holman. Is John online? Okay, he's not here. Oh, um, I missed that. Lizzie Sebring? Good afternoon, Chair Rolfus, members of the committee. My name is Lizzie Sebring. I'm a parent in the 44th Legislative District and Advocacy Director for Washington State PTA, the state's largest child advocacy organization. We would like to thank Governor Inslee for recognizing the need to increase funding to support services for students with disabilities. The cap lifted 15%, increased to safety net, and $10 million for training and inclusionary practices are appreciated, but it is not enough. We recognize that the legislature has made advances to funding basic education. Unfortunately, significant gaps still exist in special education funding, which has one of two results. Districts must use enrichment levies to fill the gap between state funding and the services our students with disabilities need, or students go without the services that support their success. Their success. According to OSPI, Washington school districts spend 18% more than they receive for special education, a $400 million a year funding gap. We ask you to support a budget that removes the arbitrary cap, increases the multiplier, and gives our students the support that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have Jake Garcia? Oh, no, sorry, oh, I'm getting mixed up here. Um, Jim Kowals Kowalski. Good afternoon. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Jim Kowalski. I retired in June of this past of 22 after serving for the past 15 years as superintendent at Davenport. But I continue to serve as the director of the Rural Education Center. Uh, it's a 90 small rural districts joined together uh, just to make sure you consider it small, the needs of small rural schools. I wanna compliment the 2023 legislature and, and this committee for continuing to allow remote testimony. For those of us who live in rural communities a long ways from Olympia, it's very much appreciated. I signed in as other regarding the governor's annual proposed budget for K-12 public schools. While there is some increased funding, the real need, and you've already heard it, I'm sure you're gonna hear it again tonight, is the need for increased special ed. Currently, uh, we have 13.5% cap on special ed. Uh, it's gonna be increased to 15% in the governor's budget. It's moving in the right direction, but if the school district has 22% of the kids in special ed, the shortfall is there. Uh, thank you very much uh, and have a great session. Thank you. Jenny, would you like to come forward, please? Go ahead. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jenny Plaza, and I'm here on behalf of the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. We're here today testifying other. As many of uh, our colleagues have shared, we are grateful to see some of the investments in the governor's budget, um, specifically the educator workforce or residency program, maintaining the investments in critical support staffs in our school buildings, and also for supports in areas like early learning, child care, and mental health. And we do have a long way to go. Many of the needs that we're talking about today and bringing up with you in K-12 are not new, yet arguably they're more important than they've ever been before. And our students are asking for more from us, from our system. Um, so fully funding services for students with disabilities, increasing or removing the cap and addressing the multiplier, creating a more adequate student transportation system, providing students with meals at no cost and continued investments in student supports. We are in recovery and now is not the time to pull back on our investments in K-12. Thank you for all the work that you do and for having us today. Thank you. Jake Garcia. And Rick, why don't you also come up? And as Senator Robinson calls your names, just fill out, fill in the panel. Um, so we just always have three people sitting there. Thanks, Jake. Of course. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jake Garcia. I'm, I'm testifying on behalf of Northwest Harvest, Washington State's uh, statewide food justice organization. Uh, I'm testifying in support of the governor's uh, proposed budget, operating budget, with a couple of caveats. Uh, specifically, we thank the governor for supporting and ensuring K-12 students uh, have access to free school meals, um, but this item doesn't cover all kids in our state, um, and we'd like to see the funding for universal school meals, school meals for all. Um, additionally, we know that hunger doesn't uh, end when you step onto a college campus, and we would like to see funding included for the Basic Needs Act. Um, again, as it stands, food banks like ours uh, don't get by just on our own, and we do need uh, the support of this committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rick? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Rolfus, Ranking Member Wilson, members of the committee. I'm Rick Chiza with Public School Employees of Washington, representing 30,000 education support professionals. We thank you for the tremendous investments that were made in the current two-year operating budget for our public schools and universities. These investments help equip our public schools and universities to more effectively meet the evolving needs of our student populations. Unfortunately, despite the paramount duty of our state, the share of this proposed operating budget dedicated to public education is down dramatically from just a few years ago. This session, we ask you to reverse that trend. As the committee takes on the work of writing a new budget, PSC encourages you to prioritize funding for special education, universal school meals, and employee compensation. We look forward to working with you on these and other education priorities. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few remote folks next, uh, Sue Ann Booby and Ramona Hatt Hattendorf, but I would like to ask Linda Hall, Mitch Denning, and Charlie Brown to please come forward and be ready to testify. And then we'll go back to Sue Ann, who's remote. Well, hello and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sue Ann Booby, and I am the proud parent of a deaf and blind child. I have been a teacher and an administrator in education for the past 20 years, and I currently serve as the director for special services in the Mercer Island School District. I'm here to tell you that my district cannot keep pace with the ever increasing complexities of serving students identified as needing special education services. We need your help and support. I know that you have been working on funding for special education services, but our students need a more holistic approach. The resources provided by our state are not adequate. Districts continue to be forced to use local levies to close the funding gap. We care about our students, all of our students, as I know you do. Funding must be a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Ramona Hattendorf. Hi, uh, good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. Um, I am Ramona Hattendorf with the Arc of King County. We protect and promote the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we also work to build inclusive communities. I'm testifying other today on the special education portion of the governor's proposal. So we support students whose services do not come through, whose evaluations are put off, and who are effectively denied access because the school can't secure an egg. 
we need to end the cap on special education, um, not just push the number up. I want to really be clear. I'm actually not talking about a lot of kids in King County or Seattle area or in the suburban areas. I'm talking about kids in small and rural districts where they're really limited on their access to funding. They get lower per student to start with because of the general allocation. The multiplier keeps them low and then they take low shallow pool of funds that they have to spend more, thin, more thinly because they're cut off. And we really need to end this. So we really support, please not just lift, end that cap. Yes, do please increase the multiplier across all grades. It's desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you. That was... Linda Hall. Good afternoon, Chair Rolfes and committee members. Uh, my name is Linda Hall. I'm the government relations person for Treehouse, Washington's leading organization focused on educational equity and students in foster care. We are pleased to sign in pro on this proposed budget. We would like to thank the governor for including $6 million to expand our Treehouse graduation success program that serves over, that can serve over a thousand middle schoolers across the state. Uh, since the program's inception, the statewide foster care graduation rate has increased from 36% to 53%. Research suggests that we would be even more effective um, if we started earlier, and students who struggle in middle school are very often high risk of being off track for ninth grade. Uh, there are two more items that we urge you all to add to the final budget. Um, first, $920,000 in ongoing funding for uh, four treehouse educational advocates to meet the needs of students in exceptional place placements like hotels and DCYF offices and those experiencing significant educational uh, yeah barriers. Secondly, and lastly, $150,000 to fund our legislatively mandated Project Edu Education Impact Work Group. Thank you. Thank you. Mitch, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Ruffles and members of the committee. Mitch Denning, representing Momoa, the maintenance operation administrators. We're assigned another today. We do thank the governor for the $60 million for the CEP program fully funded for low-income students in some schools. And I would recommend that you folks consider the following for in your biennial budget. Uh, continuing to implement the, the prototypical school funding model, universal school meals, pupil transportation, and fully fund special ed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll turn uh, to Liz Troutman, who's remote. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. For the record, my name is Liz Troutman, Government Affairs Director at Stand for Children Washington. Um, we also convene the High School Success Coalition. We appreciate the governor's proposed investments in a strong and diverse educator workforce and continuing to increase the counselor to student ratio. However, we urge you to go beyond these investments to help students in schools recover from the pandemic, which has especially impacted educational progress for students of color and students in high poverty schools. First, please sustain and expand the proven ninth grade success teams approach. Schools with these dedicated teams see double digit increases in the rate of students who pass all their classes in ninth grade. This is a strong predictor of on-time graduation. Second, invest in ensuring that all students are able to access dual credit programs such as college and the high school running start and CTE dual credit by eliminating financial barriers to participation. There's currently a 14.5% dual credit participation gap between students from low income families and their peers from middle and higher income families. Lastly, we urge you to continue to focus on identifying the most promising practices for learning recovery so that we can continue to target resources effectively. Um, I'd also like to echo the comments on the importance of special education funding. Thank you. Thank you. Preston Dwaskin. Can you hear me? I can. Good afternoon. Thank you to our office, Senator Robinson, for the time. I'm here to speak in support of the governor's budget and ask you to fully fund Special education, take the 13.5 and make it 15% or whatever you can do to make special education fully funded. It's time to get our special education students the services they deserve. Every child deserves to be treated equally, regardless if they have a disability or not. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you during this session. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Brown. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ranking uh, Member Wilson. I am Charlie Brown. I'm here today on behalf of the Pierce County and Federal Way School Districts. Uh, we are here to uh, echo the comments about special education. I think you've heard it from just about every education advocate up here. The special education formula simply is not working. It's costing local 
school districts a lot of money in their local levies and it's basic education and it's a state responsibility. We ask you to uh, increase that multiplier and increase the cap. We also support the changes in the student transportation formula. Student transportation formula is underfunded in a number of school districts. And again, they have to use local levies to cover what is basically a basic education requirement for the state. We would also request that you increase the prototypical school model staffing uh, and, and look at those you've done it in the past. We appreciate that very much for the social and emotional uh, staff persons, but anything more that you can do, it just keeps us up to date with the modern school uh, district. And then I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to take a look at regionalization. Back in 2017, when you uh, adopted the uh, McClary fix, you uh, uh, promised to take a look at regionalization. It hurts places like Federal Way. It hurts Vashon School District. It hurts that. It hurts uh, many of the districts in Pierce County. And we're all competing with that same labor pool. I would simply ask that you really take a serious look at regionalization fixes. And then, Madam Chair, you asked for a comment on the supplemental budget. I'd like to do that in the Department of Commerce budget on utility or rearages. There were some changes, challenges getting that put into place. The Department of Commerce has asked for a couple of modification in its uh, proviso. I would uh, ask you to do that. It certainly would help the constituents in Southwest Washington, which were barred from getting any assistance uh, for, for utility or rearages due to a late filing. So I would ask that you make those changes in accordance to the request by the Department of Commerce. And thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. Uh, I understand that John Holman is online now. We can have his testimony. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is John Holman, superintendent of the Lake Washington School District and speaking on behalf of the School Alignment Alliance. I'd like to focus my comments on funding for special education. The 2017 legislature modified funding for school districts based on the McCleary decision. Part of McCleary is the requirement to fully fund basic education. As of today, the legislature has not taken action to fully fund special education, which is defined by this legislature as part of basic education. Unfortunately, the governor's proposed budget does not come close to complying with this requirement. As the Senate considers appropriations for the 23-25 biennium, I implore you to take action to increase the funding multiplier for special education to comply with the directive to fully fund basic education. To accomplish this, the legislature would need to increase the per pupil multiplier. For example, Lake Washington School District will need to spend 22 million of local levy dollars to fund special education programs and services this school year. Increasing the per pupil multiplier to 1.81 would eliminate this gap. By fully funding special education, districts can move towards a more inclusive model of education by ensuring students served in special education are educated with their, in their neighborhood schools with their neighborhood peers. Thank you. Thank you. That ends the K-12 portion. We're gonna move right on to higher ed. Uh, Joe Daca, if you would please come forward and uh, just jump right in. Um, and then I would like to ask Paul Francis, Heather Moss, and Julie White to sit in the uh, front row and be ready to go soon. Joe, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Joe Dacco with the University of Washington, testifying in support of this budget today. Uh, first, this pro proposal funds two-thirds of our increased compensation costs with state dollars, the other third coming from tuition revenue. This matches our request and is our top priority for the session. Uh, second, this budget funds expansion of high demand programs um, like our rural dentistry program in Spokane, engineering and computer science programs in Seattle, Tacoma, and Bothell. And finally, uh, we're grateful this budget six shifts significant maintenance and operations funds from the capital budget to the operating budget, which would help us significantly reduce our deferred maintenance backlog. You're going to hear from my colleague, uh, Ian Goodhue, about our hospital request from UW Medicine, which is also a top priority. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Now, do we have Ben Small uh, remote? Can we get... And if the you three want to come up, that would be great. Should I have staff, should I have the 
people in person go ahead and you'll work on getting Ben. Okay. Uh, so Paul Francis, Heather Moss, and Julie, you signed up as a panel. Just go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is Julie White and I serve as Chancellor and CEO of Pierce College District. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Rolfus and committee. We're happy to be here and want to express our appreciation for the governor's investments in faculty and staff compensation. Our top priority for this operating budget is to provide competitive cons compensation so that we can attract and retain talented employees to serve our students and to teach them in the classrooms. In order to do so, we need to be fully staffed, and many of our students, as you know, were derailed during the pandemic. Unfortunately, we are losing employees to other organizations that can pay more than we are able to pay. For us, as essential as these increases are, equally essential is that these, this compensation is fully funded. We need the budget to include 100% funding for any compensation increases. Anything less is a budget cut and we will not be able to serve our students and our communities as we need to. And this may result in losing positions uh, if we do not have that full funding. Thank you so much for consideration. Good afternoon, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Heather Moss. I am a trustee for Bates Technical College in Tacoma, the 27th district. I was appointed by Governor Inslee in 2017 and confirmed by the Senate in 2018. Thank you, Senators Billig and Senator Conway for facilitating that process. I'm here to, uh, to support the governor's investment of $60 million in the CTC systems workforce training programs. As you know, there are educators and there are employees across the state who are looking for for a skilled workforce, and your community college system is really crucial to making that happen. We have programs like machinists, electricians, fire services staff. Uh, we also have the only denturist program in the state. And colleges like Bates are key to rebuilding our workforce. And these programs are expensive. We have such specialized equipment, small class sizes, and consumable supplies that make these more expensive. Bates College needs a new fire truck. Ours is 15 years old. They're about a half a million dollars. Just giving you a, a set there. Um, so please maintain the governor's proposed increase for preserving our community and technical college workforce training program to ensure that we have rele relevant equipment and resources to maintain a modern and skilled workforce. Thank you. Chair Rolfus, uh, Ranking Member Wilson, uh, good afternoon. I am, my name is Paul Francis. I'm the brand new Executive Director of the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Our system's vision is to lead with racial equity, uh, where our colleges maximize student potential and transform lives within a culture of belonging that advances racial, social, and economic justice in service to our diverse communities. We appreciate the governor's support for our request to advance our DEI work. Full funding of this request will enable us to implement our EDI strategic plans and close equity gaps for our students of color while meeting the goals of two bills that you passed in 2021, Senate Bill 5194 and Senate Bill 5227. Finally, we hope the legislature will consider our request to expand learning technology for students. The remote options that arose from the pandemic are the new normal. Students, especially working adults, need the flexibility of learning in classrooms, online, or a mix of the two. We're asking for investments in technology equipment and training to make online classes and student services like financial aid or advising more accessible and effective. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go back to Ben Small, who's remote, but I would ask Nora Slander, Jacob Vigdor, and Sandy Kaiser to please come forward and be ready to go right after that. Ben, and then, sorry, uh, Karen Strickland, you are, you will be next. So uh, after those three, so we'll go to Ben now. Good evening, Chair Rolfus, honorable members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ben Small, and I'm the executive director of Launch Northwest, based in Spokane in the third legislative district. Our mission is to support all students on their pathway to um, high school graduation and then support them as they take the next step after high school. This can be a four year college degree, two year cert certificate, or technical credential. As you know, research shows that post high school education and workforce training create prosperity for individuals and communities. We're very supportive of the governor's support of the regional challenge grant. At Launch Northwest, we have raised private sector funds to support a promise scholarship, which will open the doors to post high school opportunities and have developed public sector partnerships with our city, county and federal governments to support implementation of Launch Northwest. 
To be successful, however, in building the scholarship fund, we're asking to partner with the state of Washington to help us in this endeavor. Thank you for your consideration tonight and we'll submit more detail to you via email. Thank you. Thank you. Nora, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Olfus and members of the committee. I'm Nora Sealander, Director of Government Relations at Western Washington University, here testifying pro on this budget because it supports some of our top priorities. First and foremost, we appreciate the improvement on the state share of compensation costs, as well as expanded offerings on the Kidsap and Olympic peninsulas. Having more degree options in this historically underserved area is critical to moving toward a statewide 70% credential attainment goal. While this budget includes funding for our new graduate offerings in clean energy, we hope that you'll also consider funding proposals for electrical and computer engineering and an expansion of computer science offerings. These investments are supported by industry leaders and aim to meet workforce needs. Research shows that lowering faculty to student ratios make a significant difference in course completion especially in remedial math and English. The funding in this budget for first year retention initiatives will make that a reality at Western. I also wanna echo my colleague at UW. We appreciate this budget restoring the policy of funding campus building repairs and preventative maintenance with general fund dollars. Thank you. Jacob. Thank you, Chair Rolfes, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'm Jake Vigdor elected faculty legislative representative for UW, um, and I, we are, I'm here to represent my colleagues in support of, of Governor Inslee's budget. Um, Director Schumacher told you a little bit about recruitment and retention being a priority. I just wanted to tell you a personal anecdote. One of my assignments as a faculty member at the Evans School at, the, at UW is to teach quantitative methods to our master's students. I, last year, I was one of three instructors for that course, and I'm the only one left. We lost two out of three. Um, so we really need to work on recruitment and retention. The investments in compensation will help with this. We are particularly enthusiastic about the improvement of what they call the fund split. So the share of compensation increases that come from the state budget rather than tuition. As faculty, we really believe in keeping financial burdens on families low and the less pressure there is on tuition, the, the happier we are. So the movement to 66% is wonderful. We would love to see it go even higher than that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Kaiser. I'm here on behalf of the Evergreen State College, where our incoming class in 2022 was 17% larger than the year before. Evergreen really appreciates the support for our students, staff, and faculty that are reflected in this forward-facing budget. We know it will enable us to serve the military veterans, the tribal members, the returning adults who do so well with an Evergreen education. We deeply appreciate your continued support for the college and your support for higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Strickland is next, and I would like to ask Chris Mulek, Steve DuPont, and David Burai to come forward, and Michael Moran and Sophie Rachai, you're following them, so you can just get ready. Is Karen ready? I am. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rolfus, committee members. Thank you for the time to speak to you regarding the governor's proposed budget. My name is Karen Strickland. I'm the president of the AFT Washington State. I'm here today representing the thousands of faculty, classified, and pro staff who provide students with the opportunities and the supports they need to, success, to succeed in their lives and careers. We're pleased to see the COLAs in this budget. We'd like to see them funded at 100 So full funding will make a significant difference. Also troubling is the absence of a general salary increase for pro staff and faculty, whose salaries are roughly 14% below peers in other states, and for faculty, 12% below K-12 teacher salaries. The low salaries of these high workers are resulting in high turnover, unsustainable workloads, and disruption to students' ability to access the services they need to be successful. This harms these workers, students, and our state, which needs a well-educated public to participate in civic life and to fill the jobs in a wide array of industries, both public and private sector. On behalf of my members, I urge you to consider the harm done by shortchanging the CTC workforce. That is, the workers who build the workforce vital to thriving communities. 
Please commit to the full investment our members need. And thank you for your work in the legislature. Thank you. Chris Mulek. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Chris Mulek of WSU here today signed in pro. This budget makes some important investments in WSU's College of Nursing as it enters its next accreditation cycle and in a new public health degree program for the Spokane, Pullman, and Vancouver campuses. WSU also fully supports the governor's initiative to establish a clean energy research uh, institute at WSU Tri-Cities. And for your consideration, we've also submitted a proposal around a social work a degree program for, for Tri-Cities. I do need to point out that funding in this budget is sufficient to provide COLAs of just 2.5% in FY24 and 1.3% in FY25. The delta between that and the prescribed 4% and 3% is based on an assumption that there'll be new tuition revenue to cover it. And unfortunately, that new tuition revenue just isn't there. We're hoping you could help us get to that prescribed 4% and 3% as it's the university's top priority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Steve DuPont representing Central Washington University, and we are overall in support of the governor's proposed operating budget. Our top priority this year was also to have improvement made on the fund split. You've heard a lot from our colleagues about that already. Unfortunately for Central, the governor's budget does not make any improvement on that, which is particularly unfortunate because Central serves over 90% in-state undergraduate students who pay the lowest tuition rate available. So we have the least amount of tuition resources to apply towards that fund split. Um, what we do like about this budget is it fully funds our student success package. This is important. Central enrolls a lot of first generation and underrepresented students who are uh, disproportionately affected by pandemic related learning loss. So thank you for that. Um, we also uh, get part funding for our teacher shortage package. Uh, we would encourage you to do the full funding, which helps with dual language and STEM teachers. Um, the governor's budget neglects to fund our financial literacy package. We think that's a very important thing in K-12 and higher ed. So we, uh, we would like to ask for that. And finally, we would also like to thank the governor's office for funding the facility maintenance that was coming out of our ability to do minor works in the capital budget. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, uh, Ranking Member Wilson, I'm David Burey from representing Eastern Washington University today. So good to be in person and in front of you today. Uh, we're signed in pro, the governor's budget funds EW's top three priorities. You've heard about the cost of living increase of faculty and staff. We thank you for that work. Campus safety. Uh, this important investment would allow Eastern to purchase and install much needed cameras of uh, Brown's campus and also uh, would provide some additional personnel to help with the Cheney campus and also the Catalyst building in Spokane. So we appreciate the governor funding that. The nursing program of $4.6 million, a real special thank you to Senators Billy, Schessler, Ron and Robinson and this entire committee that helped fund, uh, give us some money to jumpstart in the cap in the supplemental budget, our nursing program. Um, the ongoing investment found in the governor's proposal fully funds a program that by 2025 will be graduating 80 nurses from Eastern Washington University per year. Eastern is also fully supportive of the investment in the UW budget for um, ride expansion. So we look forward to working with you with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I would just ask, do we have Sophie Rachai with us? Good afternoon, uh, Chair Wolfless, Ranking Senator Wilson, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Michael and Moran. I was not planning to testify in the higher education budget until I literally opened my alumni newsletter and saw that my graduate and undergraduate uh, advisors had passed away. And I rem reminded myself that 40 years ago this month, I was an EWU Senate intern for then Senator George Fleming. During that time, Eastern bought a bank building against the wishes of the Senate. The nursing, the nursing school was on the seventh floor of the Bon Marche building when I was in college, and now we have a beautiful downtown campus. This Senate, the senators before me and those who have come before you have supported Eastern Washington University. Thank you. Please support the governor's budget. And again, thank you for all that you do for higher education in the state of Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sapir Chai, and I am a legislative liaison for South Puget Sound Community College. Today, I'm advocating on behalf of basic needs of South Puget Sound Community College and institutions all across the state. Funding in this legislature for basic needs is critically important to me and my campus because poverty does not disappear in college. If anything, it is exasperated. 
According to the Washington Student Experience Survey conducted by WASAC and Western Washington University, 49% of students surveyed experienced basic needs and security, 38% of respondents experienced food insecurity in the last 30 days, and 34% of respondents experienced housing insecurity in the last 12 months. It is crucial that every student has their basic needs met, such as food security, to remain in college and finish their education. It is important that we strive for a hunger-free campus all across the state. We hope to count on your support for basic needs in the fiscal biennium operating oper appropriations bill. Thank you. Thank you. We are, that ends higher ed. We're gonna move on to early learning. Um, and I would like to ask Erica Halleck and Melissa Johnson to please come forward. And then um, Daisy Cruz, uh, Mustafa Kebe, and Colleen Condon, Emily Murphy, and John Dixon be ready to go. Thank you, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erica Halleck. I'm representing Start Early Washington. The theme of workforce that you heard in the last few panels extends to early childhood, particularly in our child care space. So I'm speaking in favor of Governor Inslee's fund funding to support a reimbursement rate for Working Connections Child Care, which helps families get to work, um, as well as um, helps those children's educational attainment as well. And additional we support the governor's proposed investments in voluntary home visiting. This too will address workforce and help serve additional families. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Melissa Johnson, speaking on behalf of the Washington State Association of Head Start and ECAP in strong support of the funding in the governor's budget on ECAP programming. The governor's budget includes a 40% rate increase for ECAP programs, and this rate is the result of a rate study that DCYF performed that showed that to pay qualified staff fairly, a 40% rate increase um, was necessary um, for our staff. Kindergarten teachers currently make about $20,000 more than our ECAP preschool teachers, um, and meeting the Fair Start for Kids entitlement requires us to hire quality staff and retain them. We were disappointed to see no expansion in early ECAP in the governor's budget, um, and we will ask for uh, ex ex expansion for that in this coming session. Um, finally, we support the $10 million investment in the governor's budget for the uh, Early Learning Tribal Fund. Um, this fund is, is designed to support tribal ch children in early learning programs, including ECAP, Child Care, Head Start, Early Head Start, and Home Visiting Programs. And the Tribal Early Learning Fund has been endorsed by a number of our tribal nations and the wa in Washington State, as, long, as well as the Tribal Leaders uh, Congress on Education. Thank you. Thank you. Daisy Cruz. Hello. Um, thank you, Chair Rolfs, uh, Ranking Member Wilson, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Daisy Cruz, and I live in Granby, Washington. I have a three-year-old Darla that was diagnosed with autism at the age of one and a half. I wanted to tell you about the importance of home visiting. When my daughter was one year old, we noticed that she was lacking her milestones. As we brought her concerns to her doctor, we were frequently dismissed, but my concerns were assured by her home visitor that something wasn't right based on her ASQ. Uh, months after she was diagnosed, we found out that she was a few months behind developmental. Tilly, at that point, I lacked resources support and we were in the middle of a pandemic. That was a couple years ago. Darla is three and succeeding and receiving adequate resources for her. The impact is real and raw. As parents, there is no guidebook to help us be the best teachers for our children, but there is home visiting. That is the closest thing we have to helping our children reach their potential in their first five years of brain development. I ask the Ways and the Mean Committee to make sure that home visiting services account a priority so children can receive early intervention and have a stronger outcome. Home visiting has helped families like us. Thank you. Um, Daisy, thank you for joining us from Grandview and sharing your family's experience. Mustafa? Good afternoon, Chair Rolf, Vice Chair Robinson, and members of this August committee. My name is Mustafa Kebe, and I, I am, uh, work for Kindering as their Chief Program Officer. Kindering is a nonprofit that provides services for young children with developmental delays and disabilities. I'm here testifying other on SB 5187. First, I want to commend this committee for the initial steps um, on this budget session. 
uh, for greater investment in special education for the three to 21 year olds. I am testifying other because I want to um, ensure that when we invest in special education, infant and toddlers are not left out. Um, in Washington state, um, Kindering and many other organizations such as Kindering that provides uh, services for toddlers and infants um, are learning low on financially, are they struggling? we are struggling. And although um, early support are, are one of the most effective ways to support children with diverse needs, the budget does not currently include an increase in ACID funding. Um, we want to um, clearly state that 85% of um, a child's development happens in the first three, uh, in the first um, three years of the child's life. Therefore, we urge all of you to consider funding um, our ECIT uh, um, budget. And we want to thank you all for um, considering this and we'll work with you all through the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Colleen Condon. Hello, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Colleen Condon here speaking on behalf of Washington Child Care Centers Association. I would like to highlight the critical need for stabilization grants for the small businesses that comprise the majority of the child care industry, serving tens of thousands of Washington's children. Grants are not currently funded in the governor's proposed budget. However, since the release of the proposed budget, our federal government has approved significant funding increases to the Child Care and Development Block Grant Program, which supports the bulk of our state's early learning budget. We know this increased funding would be best utilized by providing grants to all providers, as outlined in our priorities. I will submit that uh, outline electronically and share it directly with members of the committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Emily Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Emily Murphy here on behalf of Child Care Aware of Washington. Our state has made incredible progress in building towards the best early learning system in the nation. And yet our child care workforce is in crisis. The 43% turnover rate and poverty wages for child care educators continues to undermine access for families. We support the governor's rate increase for working connections to the 85th percentile and background check fee assistance. Please also invest in enrollment-based pay for working connections, increase the infant rate enhancement and non-standard hour bonus and waive licensing fees. The mental health crisis facing childcare programs is immense and we urge you to expand the mental health consultation program to 4 million to address the wait list across the state. Finally, please invest in family, friend, and neighbor caregivers by expanding play and learn group funding to 2.4 million for the 70% of children under the age of six not in a formal child care program. Thank you. Thank you. John Dixon. Good evening, committee members. I'm John Dixon, uh, president and CEO of Spokane County United Way. On behalf of the United Ways of the Pacific Northwest, thank you for the state's current financial support of the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, uh, which through the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction funds 50% of the three free books that our state's zero to five-year-old children currently receive each month. We appreciate and support the governor's proposal to include $5.279 million in his 2023 to 25 state proposal uh, for the state's general fund to continue this funding of the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Uh, this program makes available free of charge all kids in our state, zero to five-year-olds, uh, free books every month, which are age appropriate. Uh, this funding helps affiliates like us. Each county has one affiliate uh, work with the Dollywood Foundation to fund these books. Um, since September 2nd, we've signed up over 6,600 kids in our region. And to summarize, we do support the governor's $5.2 $279 million proposal to continue support of the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Thank you. Thank you. That ends that portion of testimony. We're going to move on to employee compensation. I would ask Seamus Petrie, Alan Burke, and Brandon Anderson to please come forward and give your testimony. Go ahead. Here we go. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. 
I'm Brandon Anderson with the Washington Federation of State Employees, speaking today in support of the governor's proposed employee compensation package, which includes our members' hard-won collective bargaining agreements. As you know, our members work hard every day to keep your community safe, healthy, and ready for business. They take our most vulnerable, take care of our most vulnerable, keep our passes clear, and keep our state parks in pristine condition. Our members are also the folks that take your policy visions and make them happen in our communities. Yet for nearly 20 years, our workforce has not kept pace with the significant growth in our state's population. This means mandatory overtimes, high caseloads, and burnout for dedicated public service workers. In the same time frame, wages for our workforce have lagged far behind. 20 years of growing workloads and lagging wages have created a recruitment and retention crisis. That means longer wait times and fewer services available to the public. We believe that the contract agreements are a good first step in addressing the state workforce crisis and urge your support to the agreements in the final budget. Thank you. Chair sure, Office, members of the committee, uh, oh, it's nice to be back in the saddle after so long and appreciate that. Uh, Alan Burke, Executive Director of the Washington State School Retirees Association, an organization that represents the interests of 17,000 K-12 retri retirees from across the state. I'm here today in support of SB 5187, specifically nine, Section 9133 of that bill that provides funding for a one-time 3% COLA capped at $110 a month for Plan 1 TERS and PERS retirees. This proposal comes to Ways and Means from the Select Committee on Pension Policy, a group comprised of a bipartisan mix of legislators, four of whom sit on this committee, and representative and stakeholder groups. Although the proposed one-time 3% COLA is appreciated, it is less than half the rate necessary to cover this past year's inflation. It does not reverse the trend line that has seen many Plan 1 retirees lose up to 50% of the purchasing power of their pension since year 2000. Our request is that the legislature consider a more robust Plan 1 COLA as a session unfolds. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Office, uh, Ranking Member Wilson, and members of the committee, Seamus Petrie with the Washington Public Employees Association. Um, we are here in support of the governor's budget. Um, there's a lot of good investments in public services here, and this budget begins to acknowledge and address the ongoing um, recruitment and retention and staffing crisis that you've heard about. Um, some of these investments take the form of one-time money for teachers at the School for the Deaf and the Center for Childhood Deafness and uh, Center for Deafness and Hard of Hearing Youth, um, targeted increases for communications officers at State Patrol, uh, where they had to close a, a call center in Wenatchee because of low staffing. Um, but for many people uh, who did not get targeted increases, this budget will still represent a pay cut because in, in the year where inflation is eight uh, or nine percent, there's lots of work still to do. The one thing we were really asking you to do that you heard from the community college is to fully fund the uh, community college higher ed contracts. Um, the, you used to do this, legislature used to do this, um, uh, but then stopped during the Great Recession when uh, enrollment was up and re state revenues were down. And now that position is reversed and we wanna make sure that the uh, investments are there so that these, these colleges, which are in every community, uh, remain there and to provide services um, when enrollment comes back up. Thank you. Thank you. That ends employee compensation. We're moving on to mental health. Um, if Thir Clifford Thurston, Brent Freeman, and Joan Miller could all get ready. Uh, and then I would also ask Ian Goodhue, Sol Villarreal, and Jim Hedrick to please come forward. Clifford, whenever you're ready. Our is Ian Goodhue, Sol, or Jim Hedrick in the room? Could you come up and testify, Jim, please, while we're waiting for folks to get ready to vote? <laughs> mm. 
Thank you, Senator. Members of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, I'm Jim Hedrick here today on behalf of Daybreak Youth Services. We have facilities at Clark and Spokane counties and provide inpatient and outpatient mental health and addiction services for youth. We are in the state's largest Medicaid provider for youth residential behavioral health treatment for co-occurring substance and mental health disorders. Currently, Daybreak is the only sex trafficking receiving center for youth in the state of Washington. And we are in the process of reopening two suicide mental health units. Not in the governor's budget was Daybreak's budget request of $3 million to address ongoing workforce shortages, maintenance and expansion of services, and maintaining the lone youth sex trafficking program in the state. We're asking the Senate Ways and Committee to please uh, consider our uh, small but impactful budget request and look forward to working with the committee as you develop your budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Joan Miller. Hello. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Joan Miller with the Washington Council for Behavioral Health. Ian. We want to thank the governor for including a 7% rate increase for community behavioral health providers. Our system continues to face extraordinary workforce challenges resulting from years of low Medicaid rates. Those low rates translate into low salaries leading to a massive exodus of staff. Compounded with inflation, it has left us unable to meet the rising needs in our communities. An unprecedented 74% of our providers have limited or closed outpatient admissions. On average, it takes almost nine months to fill critical positions. This has resulted in more and more people going into crisis. We can't fix this without your help. Unlike other health systems, 85 to 95% of the people we serve are on Medicaid. This means our providers do not have a varied payer mix to help us balance out low Medicaid rates and allow us to pay competitive salaries. Last year, Oregon raised Medicaid behavioral health rates by 30%. We urge you to build on the 7% included in this budget and make a bold investment so we can provide the treatment that's so urgently needed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have Brent Freeman? Ma'am. Please go ahead. Chair Olfuson, committee members, thank you for uh, taking time to listen to our inputs today. My name is Brent Freeman and I'm the superintendent of Wakayakum School District, a small, uh, small district in Wakayakum County with less than 500 students. While we appreciate your support for education, I must share the unfortunate reality that schools are in crisis. Without support from you, I fear for our youth, our staff, and our future. Post-pandemic classrooms are experiencing explosive and, uh, explosive and disruptive behave, uh, student behavior like never before because of children's social skills and emotional development have er eroded to the point that teachers can't teach and classes can't function because of behavior disrupts learning for all. The current prototypical model only funds a minor fraction of a mental health pos professional position in a district like Wakaya. That said, thanks to the resourcefulness and collaboration of ESD 112, our students and staff greatly benefit from ES, uh, ESD 112's behavioral and mental health support partnership. And thanks to one-time ESSER funding, we have uh, now the first time, for the first time ever, have a mental health specialist who sees students regularly and uh, dis, uh, disarms them and gets them ready for class. Uh, I implore you to consider funding for ESD's mental and behavioral health support in this year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clifford Thurston. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Very good. Clifford Thurston, the Executive Director of World Bridges for over 20 years advocate educator for developing a peer mental health peer support workforce so this you know i'm i'm, I'm hitting at the, the biggest crisis in america today and in washington state is mental health so in briefing the uh um this budget bill there needs to be some language in there that supports and funds certified peer support specialists that the Washington State Healthcare Authority is doing. And they informed me this is be a record year for training for that. But there's a linkage here. We need to build a bridge here. So we need to have more language in the bill that supports mental health, certified mental health support 
counselors and more money for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe we have Sol Villarreal now on uh, video. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a, real, a residential real estate agent in Seattle, and I'm here to speak in favor of using general fund money to permanently backfill the full shortfall in document recording fee revenue for affordable housing. Home purchase volume was down 43% across the state from December of 2021 to December of 2022, and refinances were down 84% nationwide as of last fall, which makes sense because if you bought a refinanced in 2020 or 2021 at a 3% interest rate, Refinancing at 6% or 7% just doesn't make any sense. So it's unclear when the number of real estate recordings will return to what it was in 2020 and 2021, but it's likely not going to happen until interest rates come back down significantly. And that probably won't be happening anytime soon. So as all of you know, our state's most vulnerable residents really can't wait. The legislature's funding for affordable housing and homelessness prevention is absolutely critical. And it's important that we continue to fund the existing commitments we've already made. Thank you. So, DACA, it looks like you might want to testify on behalf of UW Medicine. Thank you. My apologies, Ian. I was called away, so you're going to have to listen to me again. Um, Chair of Office, members of the committee, I'm Joe DACA, uh, this time representing UW Medicine and its public hospital system. I want to thank the governor and his budget team for two different buckets of needed funding for our hospitals. Um, first, one-time funding of $100 million for Harborview Medical Center and UW Medical Center in his proposed second supplemental budget. Um, since COVID and, and, and throughout the pandemic, our hospitals have, have struggled to recover uh, due to the patient population we serve, the growing labor shortage of key frontline providers, and the persistent problem of difficult to discharge patients. Um, this, this funding is critical to, to fill an ongoing gap. Um, we're also going to work to demonstrate over the next couple of months um, that similar funding in FY24 and 25 will help us stay afloat uh, and uh, new federal programs to help us make uh, those gaps long term uh, go away and, and not the state's obligation. Um, the, hospital, the second bucket of funding uh, the governor provided supports the opening of the UW's new behavioral health teaching facility. Uh, the legislature created this hospital a couple years ago uh, in partnership with UW Medicine. This will open in early 2024. The governor's budget contains two pots of uh, operating costs so we can staff this hospital uh, and make sure that it can be successful in its mission. Um, we stand ready to answer questions about the behavioral health piece and the funding needing going forward. And thank you for letting me testify again. Thank you. That ends mental health. We are now moving on to other human services. We have a lot of people signed up in this section. So we'll start with Bob Cooper, Diana Stadden, Courtney Williams, and Sean Swope. And um, just for folks remote, if Jill May, Jeff Clare, Whitney Carlson, and Michelle Thomas can uh, get ready. Bob, are you? Madam Chair, members of the committee, good evening. I guess it is evening, it's quarter to six. Um, Bob Cooper here on behalf of the Washington Association of Drug Courts and in support of the full appropriation of the criminal justice treatment account for its original purpose. There's a little outdated language that's uh, in the, the bill and uh, that can be stricken. Uh, I assume Senator Dingra is nodding her head. We can work on that. Um, I also want to support the appropriation for courts of limited jurisdiction for their therapeutic work. And this is a both and. This is not an either or. So, Senator Dingra, you get to you get to take the lead on this. Uh, I hope both of them can remain in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, good afternoon, evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Diana Stadden with the Arc of Washington State for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. First and foremost, we desperately need the three-legged stool of housing, support services, and workforce fixed. We have children and adults living in hospital rooms with no medical need. 
Clients want to move out of state institutions to a community setting, and that's their right by federal law that they can't. They've been waiting for a couple of years in there. The three-legged stool is broken, and we need to fix it. We've got to increase capacity and pay rates for the direct support professionals and the skill and expertise that they have. We need to pay them for helping people with complex support needs. And we must provide educators and programs for the kids that we are now sending out of state, tearing them away from their families, sending them to New Jersey or Utah or other states at a huge cost that we should be putting into our state. So I hope you will think about those things as you work on your budgets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Rolfes and committee members. For the record, my name is Courtney Williams. I'm the Executive Director for the Community Employment Alliance. CEA represents roughly 77% of employment and community inclusion service providers contracted with the Developmental Disabilities Administration. The 2022 legislature passed two bills expanding employment and community inclusion services for people with developmental disabilities, House Bill 2008 and Senate Bill 5790. They also also requested a study to determine a suitable rate for contracting these services and sustaining a workforce. Unfortunately, the governor's budget only funds 30% of a rate increase recommended. With 12 years with no increase, it creates a workforce crisis. For this reason, CEA is signing in con to this budget the governor's budget. How will the legislature reconcile the 2022 legislation that increased services and a governor's budget that does not fund a rate to sustain a workforce and provide the services? Our ask is that the legislature support a line item to compensate for the governor's budget gaps. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to working with you this session. Thank you. Sean Swope should be on remote. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Good evening. Chair, committee members, my name is Sean Swope and I'm a community or a county commissioner for Lewis County. Persons with developmental disabilities in Lewis County are already being neg negatively impacted by a lack of services in our community. This lack of services for our valued but vulnerable community members is direct, directly correlated to the underfunding of our providers. Currently we have three community inclusion providers but our largest provider is ending their program at the end of the month due to insufficient rates. The two agencies that remain have the capacity to take on, they do not have the capacity to take on new clients. That means a good portion of our community members will not be able to access services due to a provider struggling with insufficient rates closing their programs. I am signed in as con to the governor's budget and ask that the legislature to support a line item that seeks to compensate the go governor's gaps in funding mm -hmm. employment and community inclusion services for persons with developmental disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Is Erica Hollick still here? I see her coming. Uh, can we get Jill May um, up while Erica comes forward? Hi, Chair Rolfus, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jill May. I'm the executive director of the Washington Association for Children and Families. WACF represents nearly 50 member private agencies across the state that provide services at every point along the child welfare continuum. We want to thank the governor for prioritizing caregiver placement support in his budget. CPAs are being asked to provide the same high quality support and services they provide for their families to kinship families and families licensed by the state. In order to be able to effectively accomplish this work, we need to be fully funded after suffering from underfunding for years. We were disappointed that funding wasn't included for independent living services. Independent living providers have been working closely with DCYF on a request for funding that would expand the number of youth served across the state, including youth exiting juvenile rehabilitation. These services are designed to assist youth and young adults ages 15 to 23 in making the transition from foster care to self-sufficiency. WACF strongly encourages the legislature to provide state funding for independent living services to increase the rate paid to independent living providers and be able to expand services to youth who may be at risk of exiting to homelessness. Thank you. 
Thank you. Erica, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Erica Halleck. I'm here now representing the Family Impact Network, which serves as the network administrator for certain child welfare services in Central and Eastern Washington. This includes family time, which involves coordination of visits between parents and children when that, par when that child, rather, is in out-of-home placement. Here to speak in support of the governor's proposal that the full scope of that contracted work be compensated Compensated. And while the rate increase that was provided last year really helped stabilize that network, it is really also really important that their full scope of work be compensated. This includes time for missed visits and court reports, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Gomboski and Scott Sigmund, please come forward. And while they're doing that, can we get Jeff Clare? Good evening, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Clare, and I'm the Regional Program Director for Olive Crest and also on the board of the Washington Association for Children and Families. We want to thank the governor for prioritizing caregiver placement support in the budget. Community-based child placement agencies like ours are excited to expand their critical and valuable services to all families in Washington State's child welfare system. In order to be able to effectively accomplish this work, we need to be fully funded after suffering from chronic underfunding for years. Being able to support caregivers is an important part of retention, placement stability, and timely reunification, and will lead to better outcomes for youth in foster care. Child placement agencies are being asked to provide the same high quality supports and services we provide for our families to all families, including those licensed by the state, and especially uh, for kin families. Of particular importance is increasing the licensing incentive payment child placing agencies receive for licensing a family, which includes valuable work with the family during the licensing process to ensure, among other things, they're sufficiently ready to receive a placement. Preparing families for serving these children and youth is critical and helps to promote placement stability and better outcomes for youth. Thank you for prioritizing vulnerable children, youth, and families. Thank you. Uh, just want to remind Whitney Carlson and Michelle Thomas that you will be up after the two in-person testifiers. Jeff Gomboski. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jeff Gomboski here on behalf of the Washington Healthcare Association, the State Association for Skilled Nursing and Assisted Living Facilities. Uh, we want to thank the governor for the substantial investments that he makes in our long-term care system, which has been ground zero of the COVID crisis in our state. Uh, in particular, we want to call out the investments related to direct care, indirect care, uh, an annual rebase, and enhanced funding for uh, behavioral health services. Uh, the governor's budget builds off the excellent work that the legislature did last year. Uh, we believe that that investment will go a long way to ensure stable funding in our sector. Thank you for your consideration. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Scott Sigmund here today representing Leading Age Washington, the not-for-profit long-term care providers in Washington State. We would also like to thank the governor for including in his budget the majority of the items for skilled nursing facilities that were put forth in the DSHS decision package. It's important for skilled nursing facilities to have long-term fixes in their rate structure so they have predictability. These include a low-wage work, worker add-on, additional rebasing, and an occupancy adjustment that better recognizes the low occupancy that SNFs are facing today because of the workforce shortage. In addition, one of the items that wasn't included in the governor's budget is a recommendation by DSHS for an annual inflationary adjustment that would better recognize current costs. We believe that is an important component to the SNF reimbursement system and would add additional uh, predictability and we'd appreciate if you include that in your budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go to a few remote, but I would ask Shronda Salavana, Sel sorry, Lindsay Gagnon and Marcia wright Soika to please come forward and be ready to testify. Okay, and we will go to Whitney Carlson. Good evening, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Whitney Carlson, and I am the Youth and Young Adult Services Program Director at Catholic Charities, serving Central Washington, based in Yakima and Richland. I am also the Vice President for the Washington Association for Children and Families. We were disappointed that funding was not included for independent living services in the governor's budget. Independent living providers have been working closely with DCYF on a request for funding that would greatly expand the number of youth that could be served across the state. Yeah. 
By the state taking this crucial step of funding this work, additional youth in need of these critical services would now be eligible, including JR Youth. IL services are child specific. Providers can connect youth to services, including assisting youth to obtain housing so that future youth can exit care to homelessness. We look forward to talking and working with you to ensure IL providers are able to serve more young adults with this important independent living program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Michelle Thomas. Hi, I'm Michelle Thomas with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance today, other on the operating budget, because this budget proposal will leave substantial shortfalls in funding for homeless services. The document recording fees are the primary way the state pays for homeless services and funds have declined over several months. The governor's budget does include some funding to address this, but it only assumes a 25% overall shortfall and then only pays for half of that. We are hearing that the decline much, may be much greater than 25% and only paying for half of the shortfall guarantees cuts to homeless services this year. When Washington is clamoring for all levels of government to do more to prevent and end homelessness, and when thousands of people are struggling to, to get out of the experience of homelessness, the last thing we should be facing are cuts to critical homelessness prevention services. Please pay for the full cost of the gap left by the document recording fee decline, and please carefully assess if a 25% downturn is the correct assumption. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see Shrounda, Lindsay, or Marsha. I will move on to um, Heather Kanta Mesa, Lisa Johnson, Laurie Lippold. If any of you are here, please come forward. Jim Theophilus, Alicia Kingston, Jane Pack, you'll be next. Hello, uh, Senator's office, members of the committee. I'm Lori Lippold with Partners for Our Children. It's really good to see you all. The governor's budget includes many items that are geared towards children, youth, and families, and for that, we're very grateful. They can't go through all of them, but here are some. Funding to help ensure that young people leaving state care are housed, that housing is not a barrier in terms of family reunification, and that placement into out-of-home care is prevented if housing issues are addressed. Funding for a state-funded guardianship assistance program and for the continuation of the family connections program. Funding to develop an implementation plan that will allow the state to end the practice of taking SSI and other benefits for young people in out-of-home care to pay for that care. And funding for a number of the priorities from the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group, including a rate increase, however, that should be bigger. There were some items that were not funded. A few are investments in the Kinship Care Navigator Program, although the budget does include funding to continue an evaluation that will help us draw down federal dollars in the future, and other critical behavioral health workforce and retention items, such as conditional grants and loan repayment. There are a number of other items that you will be hearing more about as time goes on, and I look forward to working with you. And if I might add, I think that Sharonda Sullivanoff and that team were planning on testifying remotely. And I, I believe they have links, but that was my understanding. We'll go back. For Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, could I just ask staff to look for the folks, Rhonda, Lindsay, Marcia, Heather, Lisa, see if any of them are um, remote. Um, Jim Theophilus, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jim Theophilus. I'm the Executive Director of North Star Advocates. I'd like to highlight two items in the governor's budget we are grateful for. First is fully funding the Mockingbird family, an innovative and proven approach to deliver foster care. Secondly, an initial investment to launch the process for DCYF to stop taking SSI payments from children and adolescents in foster care and major appreciation to the DCYF leadership embracing this issue. Two items we hope to see in the final budget. First, the Office of Homeless Youth Prevention Plan calls for community-based prevention services so that young people and families get the help they need and deserve before being arrested, street involved, or major family disruption. 
Secondly, North Star Advocates is proud to partner with the Healthcare Authority to sponsor a program that ensures when young people have the courage to go to inpatient behavioral health treatment, they are rewarded with safe housing and supportive services when they get discharged. Currently, that population is two thirds more likely to be homeless within 12 months than young people coming out of foster care or juvenile justice. It's a tragedy and a waste of our investment for behavioral health if we're not protecting it when they could get out of treatment. Thank you so much. Happy 2023. Thank you. Michael Mira, are you here? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Michael Mira. I'm a member of the Administrative Office of the Court Steering Committee for Family Treatment Courts. That committee has convened a housing and child welfare subcommittee, which I helped to co-chair. It did that to address a serious housing problem in the child welfare system. Almost 30% of the foster care cases happen or last longer because the family doesn't have a place to live. 9% of teenagers aging out of foster care become homeless within three months. After 12 months, 29%. The judicial term for that is holy moly. In response to that, the Housing and Child Welfare Committee has devised an innovative partnership between DCYF and the public housing authorities of the state. The governor's proposal has $11.7 million in it to fund the state's share of that partnership. It will pull down 30 million housing dollars a year and save $12 million in averted foster care costs. We thank the governor for doing that and ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask Melissa Johnson and Aaron Chazeski to please come forward. Um, we have a few remote people we're gonna pick up, but we'll get back to you. I think we now have uh, Shrounda and then Lindsay and then Marsha remote. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and community members, committee members. I'm Sharonda Sullivanoff, the Director of Public Policy for the Children's Home Society of Washington. Today, I'm here to express appreciation for the governor's budget. We see the prioritization of housing the unhoused in support of CHSW's request to the North Seattle Family Resource Center's headquarters building in Lake City. We are in unprecedented times for families and the need to cultivate and support the well-being of Washington State children and families is paramount. One pathway to do so is having resourced and supportive family resource centers. Family resource centers strive to enhance parenting skills, foster the healthy development and well being of children, youth, and families, prevent child abuse, increase school readiness, connect families to resource, develop parent and community leadership, and promote family economic success. The well being and children of families is intrinsically tied to the support and opportunities provided by the communities where they live. Having a community with access and resources can be the difference between hardships for families becoming a costly crisis. Please fund our request of $10.5 million to continue to build capacity for FRCs statewide. Thank you. Thank you. Is Lindsay Gagnon with us? Yes. Good evening. Go ahead. Um, good evening, Chair and members of the committee. I'm excited to come before you today in support of funding for Family Resource Centers. As Executive Director of Community Resource Centers for Volunteers of America Western Washington, I oversee centers that serve both rural and urban communities and will attest that our centers provide the most comprehensive and wraparound services to families, youth, and individuals in need. Family Resource Centers like ours provide com connections to local resources, emergency assistance, uh, through food, clothing, and housing support, and deliver programs aimed at increasing stability and self-sufficiency. Our goal is to see the communities we serve thrive. We want to see them stable, safe, and healthy. Family resource centers are places to turn for those in crisis and those struggling to get by, but we don't just focus on immediate needs. We help people look to the future, to a time where they aren't in need of support, and what that looks like. What's important to them, to their family, to their children. We help people reach their potentials. Support of these centers will provide communities with the best chance of reaching success at, a, at reaching a life where their children and themselves can prosper. Um, Recent research found that for every $1 invested in a family resource center, nearly $4 comes back to the community and economic benefits. This is a community best practice. Thank you for this time to testify on behalf of family resource centers. Thank you. And do we have Marsha Wright-Soika? 
Yes, good evening, Madam Chair Rolfes and members of the committee. My name is Marcia wright -Swicka and I'm the Executive Director of Family Works, a family resource center located in North Seattle. I'm honored to join my colleagues in the Washington Family Support Network to urge the committee to support family resource centers around the state in the budget. Moms and dads find their way to family resource centers when they are not sure where to turn for help. And what they find is a welcoming single point of entry to secure critical basic needs, opportunities to build social connections and support raising healthy kids. We have seen an increase in families seeking resources throughout the pandemic and right into this high inflation economy, many of whom have never sought this type of help. FRCs are underfunded, and despite the vital role we play in Washington, the state provides very little funding to this work. This budget request rec supports our staffing, training, and other capacity building efforts that ensures that we are here to stay as we pursue recovery efforts and support overall family well being. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Melissa Johnson, speaking on behalf of the Community Residential Services Association. We are the statewide association of, of supported living providers, uh, providing services for about 4,600 clients across the state with 12,000 of our direct care staff providing those services. We were uh, extremely disappointed that the governor's budget did not create, uh, did not include an, a further investment into supported living. You all last year uh, in last year's budget uh, had a significant investment in supported living that allowed us to bring our direct care staff wages up to $20 an hour. Um, we want to, uh, to build on that this session. Uh, so we will be asking for uh, a rate increase to make sure that we are not losing ground. We have clients that need our services uh, and we wanna make sure that we have the staff to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, uh, Aaron Chizewski. I'm with Food Lifeline, the Feeding America partner for Western Washington. Uh, I'd like to testify as other. This is a great budget, but we're signed in an other, as other because there's much more to do. Uh, most importantly, we wanna see funding for OSPIs, uh, school meals for all proposal, funding to expand DOH's food, fruit and vegetable program, and funding for the guaranteed basic income pilot. On top of this, we'll take every speck of budget dust uh, to add to the governor's request for emergency food and food resiliency at WSDA. Here's why this year, millions of people will turn to a neighborhood food pantry and or food provider. The federal pandemic programs like child tax credit and school meals have expired just as inflation started to rise. The uh, families that have gotten back on their feet lost the ground that they have gained. Now food banks are seeing sharp increases in need that mirrors peak pandemic levels, but food banks are operating with 75% less food in inventory. Simply put, we need food right now while we work on policy investments to end hunger for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now gonna uh, get several um, folks who are signed or remote, uh, Heather Cantamessa, Lisa Johnson, Alicia Kingston, Jane Pack, Leanne Labissiene, and Jason Bragg. So we'll go back up to Heather. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Cantamessa, Director of Family Impact at Children's Home Society of Washington, and I'm here to express appreciation for the governor's budget. We see the prioritization of addressing the workforce shortages and ask you to consider adding a P4P budget request of $6 million to stabilize the program and the workforce that it generates. P4P is a peer mentor, education, professional training, and family reunification program that serves parents and their families navigating the child welfare system. We're grateful for the funding that we've received from the state legislator in 2015 and the additional funding in 2017 to, for statewide uh, expansion. P4P has relied heavily on volunteers who have evolved into professionals. P4P is cur uh, currently grossly underfunded out of 39 counties that it serves. It only has two coordinators that are receiving a livable wage. And that makes it difficult to retain quality and devoted parents. And we're not investing in the developing the future leaders. And I wanna point out that I'm a parent who professionally developed through P4P. So your support would allow us to grow and continue guiding families through the child welfare system, developing a solid and, com and competent workforce and promoting gainful employment and lasting activity economic mobility. We ask you to consider adding this request to the final budget. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Johnson. 
Good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. My name is Lisa Johnson and I'm the Parents for Parents Coordinator in Benton and Franklin County. I'm here today to request the legislator to please support the Parents for Parents and fund our $6 million request to stabilize the program and develop the skills of parents working with parents through the child welfare system. Parents for Parents allies start as volunteers that receive a small stipend for their time. They come in with range, a range of skills. P4P builds upon their strengths and teaches parents how to market these skills in the workforce. Through relationship and professional development, they transform into leaders that will help the next family. Most of the P4P coordinators were once volunteers and they, form, and they were formerly involved in child welfare. They strive to become self-sufficient. Unfortunately, in my time as a coordinator, we have struggled to retain parents to work alongside and guide parents back to their children due to the low wages. As a consequence, we are not developing a pool of future leaders. We must be able to retain parents and support their development. The only way to maintain and build a program is by providing livable wages to families working with families. Please consider adding this request to your final budget. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Kingston. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Kingston. I'm an assistant managing attorney with the Northwest Justice Project's Eviction Prevention Unit. I am located in Spokane and I support attorneys representing tenants throughout Eastern Washington. Recently, our office represented a single mother and domestic violence survivor who is being evicted. She lives in a low income housing tax credit property, which is one of the few affordable apartment complexes in the area submitted her documentation to be recertified, but it was asked for additional invasive information, which triggered her post-traumatic stress disorder. The landlord moved to evict her for failing to provide that additional information. Our <laughs> office successfully defended two eviction actions against her and helped her submit the federally required documents for recertification. Because of the Right to Counsel program, this mom and her children are still safely housed. It is crucial that this body includes the full right to counsel budget program request in the upcoming legislative budget. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Pack. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jane Pack and I'm the Executive Director at Snohomish County Legal Services, a nonprofit legal aid organization that provides free civil legal aid. We operate the Housing Justice Project and are also a tenant's right to counsel service provider. I respectfully ask that the budget request for pre-eviction legal aid be fully funded. Our work has shown that early intervention in the eviction process has better results and has altogether um, prevented an eviction. An eviction filing has long lasting impact, particularly for those needing services the most. These funds allow us to bridge the legal needs gap for our clients, many of whom are marginalized, persons of color, have little or no English proficiency, are documented or undocumented immigrants and veterans. 80% of our cases from 2022, or approximately over 2,100 cases, came through the Housing Justice Project. Funding civil legal aid is a necessary preventative measure to getting and keeping people housed. Thank you. Thank you. Leanne. Hello, I am Leanne Labissonier. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of Catholic Charities Serving Central Washington in our kinship program. My husband and I are 63 year old uh, grandparents raising a six year old grandchild. And I think um, I speak of, of, of grandparents all over our state when I say that most grandparents don't expect to be raising a grandchild at this age. But circumstances of life, including mental uh, health of our daughter um, required that we do that. The kinship program was helpful because it helped us with getting custody of her, of our granddaughter. And also the kinship um, navigators help in walking this very difficult journey with grandparents and other kinship providers. I ask you to consider increasing funding for the kinship program. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jason Bragg. And um, following that, just get some folks ready here. We'll have Lisa Walters, uh, Nicole Mazin, John Stovall, Aaron Yared. Jason. Uh, good evening, Chairwoman Rolfus and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jason Bragg and I'm an alumni member 
of the Washington State Parent Ally Committee and a contracted social service worker with the Office of Public Defense. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Governor Inslee for including the 11.7 million for the Child Welfare Housing Program. I've been working for the past decade with families navigating various systems to hopefully reunify with their children. I've seen many times over the past decade where reunification is greatly impacted by the lack of appropriate housing. Specifically, thinking of a father most recently who was on every waiting list for the next available housing in his area. Okay. His child was ready to be reunified for the previous 18 months. It wasn't until his Office of Public Defense social worker reached out to me and I was able to get him qualified for housing, which ultimately got his child returned. He was forced to re relocate from Grant County to King County to reunify. Examples like these is what makes adequately funding programs like these a top priority. The Child Welfare Housing Program reduces the time and care for children which improves outcomes for families. It has been shown to save the state money by reducing the time spent in out-of-home care. Thank you. Thank you. Is Lisa Walters ready? I am, thank you. Thank you, Chair Rolfes and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Walters and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Seattle Housing Authority. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the Association of Washington Housing Authorities. We are thankful to the governor for the inclusion of the 11.7 million in his budget for the appropriation for the Department of Children, Youth and Families. The money will allow a nationally innovative collaboration between DCYF, the state's public housing authorities and nonprofit housing organizations. Just two examples of what this appropriation would do. It would lever leverage federal vouchers equal to over $26 million in subsidies per year for families who lack adequate housing and it's a significant factor in the imminent placement or retention of a family's child in an out-of-home care. It would provide housing and support services, saving money by stabilizing families to maintain their housing once unifi unified, saving taxpayer money. We ask that you support the 11.7 million appropriation that the governor put in his budget to stabilize families, prevent future homelessness and allow this unprecedented collaboration to move forward and succeed. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Nicole Mazin. Hi, yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, Nicole Mazin, Chief Program and Policy Officer at Amara, a community-based organization. On behalf of Amara and the families we work with, we'd like to thank the governor and their committed staff for numerous investments in children, youth, and families. Specifically, I'd like to highlight the inclusion of continued funding for the Family Connections Program which supported over 400 individuals across 10 counties in building parent and caregiver relationships that prioritize the needs of children and youth in the child welfare system. This level of funding will enable the program to operate in its current service area, and um, which includes counties both east and west of the Cascade Mountains. Thank you for considering this continued funding to support children and families. I would also like to thank the governor's office for the inclusion of the caregiver placement supports in DCYF's general operating budgets. This is important funding that will allow community-based organizations like Amara to not only continue, but also expand integral support to caregivers caring for youth in out-of-home placements and ultimately allow for greater service equity to families. So thank you for your consideration of this budget and for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of Amara. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call John Stovall next, and then we have Aaron Yared, uh, Sean Latham, Brad Banks and uh, Samuel Martin, if you're here, you can come up and um, get ready after these folks. So let's go to John. Uh, good evening, my name is John Stovall. I'm with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, uh, signed in other. Uh, I remember 2016 was a really exciting and proud year for me. Uh, as a housing specialist at DESC, I helped over 60 people move out of chronic homelessness and into permanent supportive housing. Every day my heart was really in that work and my team was just like on fire. Uh, but as a frontline provider, I was living paycheck to paycheck and it just wasn't sustainable for me to keep going in that, in that role. So like many of my peers, I eventually had to leave. So this is why I'm asking you to fund a permanent 6% administrative increase for homeless service provider contracts to stabilize our homelessness workforce. Frontline staff are often working class renters, often coming from poverty or homelessness themselves. And when wages can't retain staff, our critical outreach workers 
and case managers leave for other sectors, impeding progress towards housing, creating higher caseloads, and contributing to burnout across the board. So while Governor uh, Inslee's budget only funds a 2.8% increase, I'm asking you to fund a 6% increase to stabilize our still essential homelessness services workforce. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron Yarod. Yes, good evening, Chair Rolfes and members of the committee. My name is Aaron Yarod and I am the Senior Housing Policy Specialist at Building Change. We are a statewide nonprofit organization focused on children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the governor's proposed operating budget. We greatly appreciate the governor's investments in homelessness supports, education, and health, particularly the $1.3 billion in proposed investments in homeless and housing initiatives. We also hope that the final budget will include more funding for a small budget increase we will be requesting for the Washington Youth and Families Fund to continue helping local organizations create flexible data-driven strategies tailored to meet people's individual needs to equitably address homelessness, as well as a small budget increase, which we will be requesting for the Homeless Student Stability Program to improve education and housing outcomes for students and families experiencing homelessness. Both of these programs have existed in Washington for some time and have consistently produced positive outcomes for children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness. Uh, and we will be asking to increase both of their funding levels to 10 million each to continue this good work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Sean Latham. Yeah. Good evening, Chairperson Rolfes and members of the committee. My name is Sean Latham from Lacey, 22nd District and Director of Allies in Advocacy, a DD self-advocacy and civil rights organization. I'm signed in as other on the governor's budget proposal. Allies is for the rate increases for DD employment, education, and home and community providers. And we ask that includes supportive living providers in order for us, people with disabilities, to stay independent, we have to make sure our provider workforce is adequate. We are also for the many housing items that helps people get into safe and accessible housing. Our only concern in the proposed budget is still the state's reliance on institutional housing and services. We believe that money is better spent in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would ask Rob Huff, uh, Jeanne Mitchell, Rachel Myers, and Julie Patino to um, be ready to testify. And we'll go to Brad Banks, who's here in the room with us. Thank you, Senator Robinson, and good afternoon or good evening, I guess, uh, Chair Rolfus, members of the committee. Brad Banks here on behalf of uh, Washington's Home Care Coalition. We are a coalition made up of Medicaid home care agencies from across the state uh, here in support of the governor's budget. Um, as many of you, I think, know, the Washington Rate Setting Board worked diligently uh, over the interim to develop some really strong recommendations, uh, both for the labor and administrative sides of um, the home care system. Uh, we were delighted to see that the governor uh, accepted and fully funded those recommendations as they came uh, from the board. And we would ask that as you're developing your budget, you would carry those uh, investments forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Samuel? Awesome. Thank you, Senator Robinson and uh, Chair Rovers and members of the committee. Um, my name is Samuel Martin. I'm the lobbyist for the Washington Coalition for Homeless Youth Advocacy, a coalition of providers, funders, and advocates dedicated to improving lives of youth and young adults who experience homelessness. We're really happy to see the investments from the governor's budget. We did sign in pro to this budget, but know that there's more um, that needs to be done for the current investments of our communities. We're grateful to see the governor's continued um, um, support around the Centralized Diversion Fund, formerly the Homeless Prevention and or, formerly the prevention, the, excuse me, currently the Homeless Prevention and Diversion Fund, um, which is operated to house hundreds of young people throughout the state and to do so for less than $2,000. Um, we also would like to see the governor, or we would like to see an increase um, of the, uh, for, of the 10% of goods and services within the Office of Homeless Youth. Um, this, in, this increase would, un, would have included the Office of Homeless Youth grantees who need more resources to be able to do their necessary work. We would also like to see the Homeless Student Stability Program increased, as well as the Washington Youth Families Fund Program increased as well too. Um, again, thank you for your time and for your continued support for our communities. Thank you. 
<clears throat> I would ask Jeff DeLuca, Elizabeth Jennings, Ross Quigley, Cherish Cronmiller, and Marwan Cameron, to, if you're here in the room, to please come forward. Otherwise, if staff could find them on Zoom. And we'll go to Rob Huff. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rob Huff, and I work for the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. I live in the 27th Legislative District in Tacoma, and I also work with the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. Homelessness is a growing issue in Pierce County, where there are roughly 4,300 people who are homeless and just 1,300 shelter spaces to serve them. It is critical that the next biennial budget increases opportunities for those who are homeless. Homelessness prevention works, and providers in Pierce County are moving mountains to meet the needs of people. But the lack of affordable housing is a barrier that makes the work harder than it should be. As you draft your budget, please make sure we don't see a cut in homeless services, but instead look to increase funding for all programs. Pierce County and every county needs more support. Without this funding, the number of shelter spaces available will fall and more people will be forced to live outside in horrible conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Mitchell. Hello, my name is Jean Mitchell and I work for the Washington Housing Alliance Action Fund. I'm signed in as other and I'm from Spokane. I'm here to request that the legislature fully support the governor's appropriation of $39.5 million to eliminate the payback of benefits for recipients of the Age Blind and Disabled Program. Last year, I worked for a small law firm in Spokane that helped people apply for social security disability benefits. And I frequently serve clients receiving ABD. One of our clients' experiences with ABD ex exemplifies the current issues with the program. Essentially, she received ABD, eventually won supplemental security income, and then much of her back pay was taken away to, re to repay DSHS. This woman was disabled, elderly, and extremely low income. She had debts to repay like medical bills and back rent. She didn't have any income while a social security disability claim was being adjudicated, so ABD was a vital lifeline for her. But having to pay DSHS back was a serious hardship. Her story is not an anomaly. This year, the maximum amount a person can earn from SSI is only $914 a month, while average rent for one bedroom in Spokane is about $1,289 monthly. Vulnerable folks like this need every dollar they can get just to survive, and I ask that you support them. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Myers? Thank you, Senator Robinson, and good evening, um, Chair Ralphus and members of the committee. I'm Rachel Myers, and I'm with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. I'm speaking today on the Housing and Essential Needs Program and two specific challenges with HEN that this bud budget should address. One is that HEN is not an entitlement, so when funds run out, no new people can receive benefits regardless of need. The governor's budget expanded funding by 15 million over the 2019 to 2021 biennium, but that's still more than $11 million below what you funded in the 2021-2023 biennium. Another challenge is that because it was created as a bridge to federal benefits, when people qualify for SSI or SSDI, HEN benefits end, which means that the people, the people abruptly lose their rental assistance. This year, the maximum SSI benefit is just over $900 a month, which means someone receiving that could afford about $300 per month for rent. That's causing people to fall back into homelessness after they qualify for federal benefits. A pilot program has been in place for several years, allowing people to continue receiving rental assistance when they qualify for SSI or SSDI. I encourage you to expand funding for HEN and to expand funding to expand and increase the pilot program. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Patino. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. My name is Julie Patino and I am the executive director of Away Home Washington. We're a statewide organization that supports community-based systems change to prevent and end youth and young adult homelessness for the estimated 13 to 15,000 unaccompanied young people in this state experiencing homelessness. We applaud the continued commitment and increased prioritization of addressing homelessness and its reflection in this budget. I'm here to highlight continued support for youth and young adults experiencing homelessness. We were happy to see continued investment in the Anchor Community Initiative that is now operational in 10 rural and urban Washington communities and serves to bring all the public and nonprofit partners together with young people to engage in real-time data-driven systems change that demonstrably prevents and ends homelessness. The ACI has seen great success in places like Walla Walla, where in the past 
um, year, 60% of homelessness has been reduced. We're also grateful to see that the governor has included the Centralized Diversion Fund, now the Homeless Prevention and Diversion Fund. We ask that um, the governor increase and the budget increase from 1 million to 5 million to reflect utilization and geographic coverage of this important fund. Thank you. Thank you. Have we found Jeff DeLuca? He's on. Okay, Jeff DeLuca, and then Elizabeth Jennings, then Ross Quigley, then Cherish Crone Miller, then Morawan Cameron, and after that it'll be Demas. I see you in the back of the room. Oh, Chair Rolfe, as members of the committee, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, great to see you all. My name is Jeff DeLuca, Executive Director of the Washington State Community Action Partnership, uh, the State Association for Washington's 30 Community Action Agencies, serving poor and low wealth families and communities in every single one of your districts. Um, I'm here today to highlight our strong support for the governor's investments in weatherization and utility assistance, and also to ask you to add uh, $15,450,000 to continue our state's first in the nation match to the Federal Community Services Block Grant we received through a proviso in last year's supplemental budget. Uh, the special focus of these historic proviso funds on BIPOC and rural, community, rural communities is both increasing access to our traditional services and unlocking new partnerships with other grassroots organizations and small businesses uh, that need technical assistance and capacity building support to break down and transform systems of poverty at a very local level. Um, and uh, my fellow panelists uh, will give you uh, a few examples of some of these early successes in hopes that you'll continue this investment in community action. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth Jennings. Uh, there's no, uh, no Elizabeth and no Ross tonight. Okay, thank you for that. So Cherish. <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, committee members and the staff, good evening. My name is Cherish Cronmiller. I'm the Executive Director of Olympic Community Action Programs, your community action agency for Jefferson and Clallam counties on the majestic Olympic Peninsula. I'm here in support of continuing Washington's historic community recording, recording in which progress. was excluded in the governor's budget. Washington was the first state to match federal CSBG funding one-to-one, -one, and we did so with unique and intentional equity focus. At OLECAP, we serve a rural area. We put these dollars to work by increasing wages in an attempt to reach a livable wage for our staff. CSBG helps fund one of the only adult daycare and respite programs on the peninsula that focuses on memory loss. And CSBG helps support our West End job lift, getting workers to remote areas to jobs from Forks to Nia Bay. We have strict accountability measures and our impact is quantifiable. Please continue Washington CSBG match funding with a 15.45 million proviso for the biennium. Thank you. Thank you, um, Marwan Cameron, and then it'll be Demas, and then a long list of remote. Patricia Hunter, Mindy Woods, Laura Ellsworth, Peter Shapiro. Uh, Marwan. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Marwan Cameron. I'm the Executive Director of the nonprofit Gather Together, Go Together here in Kitsap County. Uh, I'm asking the legislature to please continue Washington's historic CSBG matching funding, which was not included in the governor's budget. Last session, Washington enacted a 7.3 proviso uh, to support the community action agencies across Washington uh, to deepen their impact, especially in historic uh, de-invested BIPOC and rural communities. This first in the nation investment made Washington the first state to match federal S, uh, CSBG funding one-to-one. -one, and we did so with a unique intentional equality uh, equity focus. At uh, G2, we are working hard to put these dollars at work. My organization provides transportation, food, information, and case management. Homelessness continues to grow and many individuals and families continue uh, to lose this battle to keep up. Many are struggling with rent, even after the eviction assistance program uh, they're falling behind. Many do not have adequate and often no transportation options to go to work 
doctor's appointments, etc. They are un unable to pay their utility bills and can't afford the skyrocketing cost of food. Please continue the Washington uh, CSBG match funding with the 15.45 uh, million proviso uh, for the biennium. Thank you. Thank you, Dimas Nestorenko. Um, good evening, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dimas Nestorenko. I'm speaking on behalf of SAU 775, testifying in support of the governor's proposed budget. Uh, home care workers support fully funding the home care rate uh, to rise uh, wages and expand benefits to include uh, and recording a starting in progress of $21 an hour. We're in, a key, uh, we're in a care crisis where seniors and people with disabilities are waiting a month uh, without care because there's not enough caregivers in the workforce. We need full funding for the home care rates as a step toward um, addressing this workforce shortage. Now in nursing homes, uh, the governor made a good start by providing significant funding for nursing homes. The legislation can improve on this allocation by adding and funding policy legislation to sustain and update the rate system to the childhood cost and continue to invest in low wages workers. We support funding and policy change to implement annual rebates and inflation adjustments. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Hunter. Good afternoon, Chair Walt Rolfes and members of the committee. I'm Patricia Hunter, the Washington State Long-Term Care Ombuds. We have the federal and state mandate to protect and promote the rights of residents and their well-being. Um, there are nearly 78,000 individuals living in licensed long-term care across the state. I'm here today to express my deepest appreciation to Governor Inslee for his proposed investments in the Long Care Ombudsman Program. The Institutes of Medicine recommends that we have one full-time ombudsman for every 2,000 residents. We're currently at 58% of that staffing recommendation. The investments proposed by Commerce over the next six years will bring the office up to full strength and ensure that we're able to fulfill our obligations to residents. I know you have many choices ahead of you this session, but I hope that you will include this critical funding for long-term care residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mindy Woods is not able to be here. Um, so we'll have Laura Ellsworth, followed by Peter Shapiro, Eric Jensen, Sheila Bab Anderson, Amanda DeShazo, and Julie Clark. Laura? Yeah, hello, members of the committee. My name is Laura Ellsworth, and I work for Council for the Homeless in Vancouver. I'm testifying other. As the hub of the homeless crisis response system in Clark County, I'm here today to sound the alarm bells and to ask you to use the general fund to backfill a funding shortfall from the document recording fee, which is the primary source of funding for the homeless crisis response system in Clark County and across the state. Because of rising interest rates, there's been a big decrease in home refinances and real estate transactions, and the governor's budget asks for half of what is needed to fill that shortfall, but the full anticipated shortfall is expected to be about twice that much. So thus the alarm bells. Cuts will be deeply felt by our community by both housed and unhoused people. Can you imagine having to tell a caller in crisis looking for emergency shelter or housing assistance? Sorry, I just can't help you. There isn't enough funding. This level of budget cuts will result in more people falling into homelessness, staying homeless longer, and will increase the amount of people living unsheltered on the streets. Please fully backfill the document recording fee shortfall. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Shapiro. Okay, some self-help is necessary. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Peter Shapiro. I am currently a, a member of the board of the Washington State Housing Alliance, Low Income Housing Alliance. I have a total of about 30 years of volunteer board service on homelessness issues. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Laura Ellsworth just gave an example of exactly what I'm talking about in general. And uh, Michelle Thomas, our advocacy director, started this conversation earlier on uh, this afternoon. The basic facts are, are as follows. Revenue from document recording fees are down. The needs of the homeless population are not decreased, not less inadequate appropriation 
can cover the recording fee shortfall. If not, homeless services will be cut throughout the state in every district. Honorary members of the committee, you can fix this problem. I urge you to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Jensen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Eric Jensen, Executive Director of Governmental Affairs for Astria Health, located in the Yakima Valley. Astria Toppenish Hospital has by far the highest Medicaid payer mix of any hospital in the state at 67%. Why is that significant? Because Medicaid pays well below the cost of providing care for non-critical access hospitals. Astria Toppenish is the smallest non-critical access hospital in the state, is located on the Yakima Indian Reservation and serves one of the poorest communities in Washington. Most rural hospitals in Washington are critical access hospitals and receive cost reimbursement on Medicaid patients. Since Top Nation is not, it cannot afford, cannot offset the soaring cost of care. In recognition of the unique challenges facing Top Nation, the legislature increased the Top Nation's Medicaid payments to 150% of fee-for-service rates in 2021 supplemental budget. Unfortunately, that increase expired June 30, 2021. Even though the Senate included it in their biennial budget proposal last year, thank you, Senate, it did not make it into the final budget bill. The Street of Top Nation's financial situation has deteriorated dramatically since then and is projecting 2022 losses of over a million Facing this crisis and funding, Mr. Top Toppenish made the difficult decision to close its obstetrics program four weeks ago. Last year, the legislature created a small distressed hospital grant program. Toppenish received some funding through the program and we appreciate it. However, however, it was not enough. We urge the legislature to restore enhanced Medicaid reimbursement to Astria Toppenish at 150% of Medicaid fee-for-service rates. Alternatively, we urge the state to substantially increase funding for the distressed hospital grant program. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Bob Anderson will be next. Um, I also would like to ask uh, Michelle McDaniel, Tim Sullivan, Angela Kramer, Brad Forbes, Diana Sullivan, and Heather Moss to get ready. That will be the last of the human services folks. So Sheila. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sheila Bab Anderson and I'm with the Campion Advocacy Fund. Uh, thank you, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee for the opportunity to comment on the governor's operating budget proposal. We are so excited by the strong funding included for homelessness services and we want to thank the governor for recognizing the need to backfill the shortfall from the document recording fee. As you know, this is a critical funding source for homelessness services across the state and the transfer from the general fund to the home security fund is essential, but we would like to see the legislature transfer 80 million to ensure that we do not see a cut in critical services, such as hotel vouchers, rental assistance, permanent supportive housing operations, and other key programs. Homelessness is one of the biggest challenges facing our state, and this fund source plays a critical role in helping our neighbors secure stable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda DeShazo. Hi, I'm Amanda DeShazo with the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium. I'm here asking you to increase the investment of administrative funding for nonprofits providing homelessness and housing services through contracts with the Department of Commerce. Staff at housing agencies shouldn't be able to qualify for their own programs. Frontline workers deserve respect and fair pay for the hard conditions they endure day after day working in shelters and with individuals living on the street. The false overhead limit placed on providers forces workers to struggle to make ends meet and causes further housing instability as an inflation raises. The governor has requested an increase of less than 3% and I'm asking that you please double that to the amount of 6%. With the abundance of ARPA funding last year, Pierce County has and is currently working hard to get new shelters and permanent supportive housing in place. These new projects will need staff support to ensure success as they carry out critical work for the state. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Clark.
She's not here. We will go on to Michelle McDaniel. Hello, and my colleague, uh, Tim Sullivan, if that's okay, will speak first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Sullivan. I'm the 2-1 State Director, and I'm here on behalf of 2 one to request a budget increase of 8.4 million dollars above the governor's two million proposal, which is actually a $1 million reduction from our $3 million um, budget in 2021-23. Since the launch of 2021, uh, uh, we've served over five, 5 million state residents. Uh, just last, last year, um, we saw an increase uh, of over 50% or have over the last two years. And 145,000 of those calls, uh, which is 11% increase, is just housing and homeless related services. Uh, for people seeking those. We also maintain the a most comprehensive database of resources in the state with uh, over 17,000 resources to help people get connected to services. Um, we have started a new partnership with 211 or 911 and 988 that Michelle will talk about that where we'll try to provide a coordinated uh, crisis response system where 211 can handle those calls that are non-emergency and help people get connected to resources. So we uh, ask for your support, thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, Michelle McDaniel, CEO of the Baker Health nonprofit organization, Crisis Connections. We operate the King County 211 text chat and call line and the King County 988 suicide and crisis lifeline programs. We have the opportunity across Washington state to link together three critical services to create an ecosystem of crisis prevention, crisis intervention, and crisis postvention. Meaning a caller to 911 or 988 who, need, who reports needing support for basic needs, such as maintaining their housing, paying their utility bills, or feeding their family will be connected seamlessly to a local 211 specialist. 211 specialists fully assess the caller situation and connect people to local resources, such that a future call to 988 or 911 is avoided. This funding request will make that outcome possible for thousands more of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair and other members of the committee. I am Angela Kramer, spokesperson for the Family Time Coalition and owner of Angela's Family Services, a family time provider. Family time occurs when children enter the state foster care system. Parents are granted court-ordered family time visits to maintain the parent-child relationship on state dependency. Safe and consistent visits increase the likelihood of successful reunification. Family time providers are the critical eyes and ears of all parties that make life-altering decisions for the families in care. We are grateful to Governor Inslee and his support team for including funding for family time separate billables. This support will help pay for those essential functions of our job. When providers have up to 40% of the scheduled visits canceled by no fault of their own, it is a huge cost to providers, making it difficult to continually operate and give a livable, consistent wage. Many of our qualified, experienced staff live paycheck to paycheck, making it difficult to support their own families. I'd like to thank you for your consideration in supporting the family time providers and the families we work with. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Forbes. Thank you, Chair Rolfus and committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Brad Forbes and I'm here with the Alzheimer's Association testifying in support of the proposed budget. This budget makes critical investments to support the needs of Washingtonians living with dementia. Thank you for continuing to fund the work of the Dementia Action Collaborative, including money to continue the expansion of the Dementia Friends Anti-Stigma and Public Awareness Program. Additionally, thank you for expanding the investment in our state's long-term care ombuds programs so that every resident of long-term care can access the services they need. I'd like to respectfully ask that you add $1.7 million to expand the Dementia Resource Catalyst pilot program to two additional sites, bringing the total number of sites to four. Dementia Resource Catalysts are positions housed within AAAs that work to fill gaps in services to people with dementia living in their own homes, allowing people to live independently as long as possible and preventing expensive long-term care placements. Thank you so much. Thank you. Diana Sullivan. Good evening, Chair of our office and, and, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Diana Sullivan, and I'm here today representing the Foundation for Homeless and Poverty Management in Kitsap County. I would like to thank the governor for his budget proposal, and we especially support the funding of communities of concern in the operating budget. We respectfully ask that you 
<clears throat> for you to include the commission's operating budget request of 500,000 for organizational capacity building and technical assistance to continue to help organizations of color under un, and under invested communities in applying for capital funding through commerce. The commission is instrumental in helping BIPOC organizations build communities in, our, in their communities. And as a BIPOC organization has benefited from this technical assistance, we were able to get our community day center project up and running so that we could provide services um, to help the people in Kitsap County. This investment will continue to provide BIPOC community based organizations with technical assistance that will help to build equity in our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Diana. That uh, concludes the public hearing on this section, the human services section of the budget. Um, I want to thank Senator Robinson for doing so much of the public hearing. And now it's my turn to clean it up. Um, we have 14 people signed in for natural resources. Only one is signed up in person and the rest are remote. So let's find out who's here. Um, Martha, let's start with Martha Wyckoff, then Deborah Esman, and Jennifer Justice. And Dana, do we have any of those guys? Um, Go I ahead. On? Oh, thank you. You're on. Yep. Thank you, Chair of Office and Honorable Senators, uh, for a chance to speak for the full funding at $2.8 million for the operations and management of the Tianaway Community Forest. Uh, for the record, I'm Martha Wyckoff and I'm a volunteer dedicated to the stewardship of the community forest. My husband and I are um, operate a hay, a Timothy Hay operation, a business in uh, the Kittitas County. I appreciate Governor Inslee's proposed funding level for the continued support of the Tianaway Community Forest and the Click Attack Community Forest. However, I'm testifying for the need for full funding of the DNR. That's our, what's going on in Clay Ellum, Judy? So many people <laughs> have <higher laughs> access. Martha. Uh, oh. Martha, we missed you like the last 30 seconds. Why don't you turn off your video and um, let us know you went, you froze at, I'm disappointed with the governor. <laughs> oh, I'm not, did not say that. <laughs> I, I appreciate the governor. <laughs> oh, goodness. I appreciate Governor Inslee's proposed funding level with great appreciation. Um, however, we do believe that the full funding of 2.8 million is critical to carry out the operations and management for the Tianaway Community Forest. For recreation, fire access roads, which are critical to the investment uh, of safety in the area and habitat restoration. Full funding is essential. Great partnerships are in place. And about 10 years ago, we invested in this magnificent uh, piece of property. And it's um, very important to continue with the stewardship and operations and management. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Deborah Estman, are you with us? I am. Good afternoon. And thank you, Chair Rolfus and honorable members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity so much to speak to you today regarding funding of the Tianway Community Forest. My name is Deborah Esman. I have lived in Kittitas County for 34 years and have been an active volunteer committee member of the Tianaway Community Forest for the last 10 years. Let the, I'm here to ask the legislator to provide full funding of $2.8 million for the Department of Natural Resources for operations and maintenance of the Tianaway Community Forest. I thank the governor for his proposed 1.5 million in his budget, but want to urge you to fund at the full $2.8 million. That $2.8 million is critical for the Department of Natural Resources to continue implementing plans for recreation, including trails and campground development, road maintenance, and restoration of, for fish and wildlife, which includes fish passage and fire resistance, resiliency and working lands. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for joining us, Deborah. It sounds like Jennifer Justice is not online, so we are gonna move to Alex Conley, then Mike Lithgow, Amy Hatchwinica, and Lance Winnicka, and Kaylee Galloway. 
So if we could start with Alex Conley. Can you hear me? We can. Right. Well, thank you, Chair Rolfus and committee members for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Alex Conley. I'm the executive director of the Yakima Basin Fish and Wildlife Recovery Board. And the board is one of the regional organizations and lead entities that help the state implement locally supported, biologically sound salmon recovery programs. We're really excited to see a robust salmon recovery package included in the governor's budget. And we're especially glad to see the proposed increases for the Salmon Recovery Funding Board's grant program and the partner capacity needed to implement it. Last year's supplemental budget allowed us to greatly accelerate implementation of salmon recovery projects in the Yakima Basin and throughout the state. And we're excited to be able to continue to increase our ability to get these key projects on the ground in the next biennium. Investing in the surfboard program, grant program, it really is one of the very best ways to do that and to get salmon recovery on the ground. So as the session moves forward, do let us know if you have any questions about our perspectives on the salmon recovery elements of the governor's budget. Thanks. Great, thank you for that offer. Uh, next, we had Mike Lithgow. He, we don't think he is with us, but if he, if he shows up, we'll pull him back in. Um, Amy Hatchwinica. Oh, you're here. Yeah. All right, welcome. Oh, thank you. Good evening, Chair and committee members. Um, I'm testifying, testifying in support of the budget as it relates to salmon recovery this evening. My name is Mike Lithgow and I work for the Kalispell Tribe in Northeast Washington, and I'm the chair of the Washington Salmon Coalition. The WSC supports and strengthens the 25 salmon recovery lead entities in Washington state as they work collaboratively to, with all salmon recovery partners to restore, enhance, and protect salmonids and their habitats in a community-based scientifically sound approach. We wanna thank you for your continued support for salmon recovery in Washington. During the last legislative session, the increased funding for salmon recovery enabled salmon recovery partners to make progress in implementation of more and larger projects and to increase the pace of salmon recovery throughout the state. During this legislative session, the Washington Salmon Coalition urges you to continue the increased investment in salmon recovery efforts statewide. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amy hatch -Winica. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Amy hatch -Winica, and I'm here representing the Deschutes Salmon Habitat Recovery Lead Entity. Um, as Mike mentioned, there are 25 lead entities throughout the state. The primary role of a lead entity is to gather the tribes, federal and state agencies, local municipalities, conservation districts, nonprofits, regional fisheries enhancement groups, and landowners to use science as the foundation of their decisions around what projects are best to protect and restore habitat for salmon. Today, I'm here to share support for the governor's budget and the investments into salmon recovery outlined therein. The entities represent the backbone of the community-based approach to salmon recovery as we bring together science and local knowledge to benefit both the fish and local communities. Lead entities are small organizations that facilitate complex conversations that enable the implementation of salmon habitat recovery projects of all sizes. Projects of every size require many cups of coffee to enable their implementation on the ground, and lead entities are the forum where many of these conversations occur. We support the governor's proposed salmon recovery and capacity investments and look forward to continue these discussions through the session. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Is Lance joining us? Um, he isn't, but Kaylee is gonna be here in his, instead. All right, Kaylee, welcome. Good evening, Chair Wolfis and members of the committee. My name is Kaylee Galloway and I'm here representing the Regional Fisheries Coalition. The Regional Fisheries Coalition comprises Washington's 14 regional fisheries enhancement groups, independent nonprofits who are some of the state's largest sponsors of habitat projects for threatened and endangered salmon and steelhead populations. Today, we are here to share our support for the governor's budget and the investments into salmon recovery. Regional fishery enhancement groups are a critical salmon recovery partner and the state's continued investment in programs and projects is key to improving salmon habitat and increasing salmon populations. Regional fishery enhancement group receives state and federal funding that gets leveraged eight to one. We are small organizations that carry out complex projects and if more projects are to be funded, we will need even more capacity funded to ca carry out Washington's salmon recovery needs. We support the governor's proposed salmon recovery investments, including attention for riparian habitat restoration and correcting fish passage barriers. Thank you for supporting our work and we urge you to continue progress and support these proposed investments. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Next up is Lucas Hall 
and then it will be Sean Egan, uh, then Isaac Castema, if you can come up, then Tom Salzer and Samantha Bruger. Get ready. So, Lucas. Chair Rolfus and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lucas Hall, and I'm the Director of Projects at Long of the Kings, a salmon conservation nonprofit. I'm here to support funding for the salmon for salmon and steelhead recovery in the governor's budget. These species are essential to our environment, culture, identity, and tribal treaty rights. Unfortunately, despite hard-fought progress, most of Washington's salmon populations are far from reaching our recovery goals and face a narrowing window for survival in the face of climate change. People are the backbone of our salmon recovery effort, which is why it is essential for our operating budget to support natural resource agencies, lead energies, and RFEGs. This is so we may increase the pace of our salmon recovery effort and preserve it for future generations. I'd like to specifically thank the legislature for supporting fish passage of the Hood Canal Bridge, where 50% of juvenile steelhead die passing the bridge. This is our state fish, and the mortality rate is high. At this single obstacle, similar is similar to all eight dams and reservoirs on the Lower Snake and Columbia Rivers combined. Your investments here support collaborative science-based approaches to tackle this environmental threat. I hope you continue to support this work as outlined in the governor's budget. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Sean. Sean Egan. <coughs> All right, we'll come back for Sean and let's, Isaac, welcome. Good, good evening. Thank you for attending my birthday party. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a hoot, yeah. Um, Isaac Castamo on behalf of Clean and Prosperous Washington. Uh, this is the first budget bill to incorporate, incorporate revenue from the state cap and invest law and the governor's operating budget. We wanna highlight a couple of priorities. Uh, the Northwest Seaport Alliance Zero Emission Truck Pilot Project there are significant investments in fueling infrastructure and passenger vehicle incentives and support for the permitting process for cleaner manufacturing facilities. Uh, going big on con in concentrated sectors can be catalytic. For example, most medium and large dairies in the state of California now have uh, digester capture systems because of meaningful incentives. And that has been a big new revenue stream for them. As you consider new revenue, we'd like you to look at uh, going big also in uh, heavy duty and medium duty trucks. If you were to look at California, they're putting about $300 million a year into that sector alone uh, for a relative scale. So the court organ this committee discuss directing cap revenues in ways that help businesses and consumers manage costs while meeting obligations to tribes, overburdened communities, uh, and adaptation as specified in the law, and some other items like sustainable aviation fuels that didn't make it into the governor's budget. So thank you very much. Thank you, Isaac, and happy birthday. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hear Sean Egan is back or with us. I am, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I am Sean Egan. I'm here today on behalf of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, the partnership between the ports of Tacoma and Seattle for the joint management of marine cargo operations. Uh, we have two items associated with the governor's proposed operating budget that we would like to highlight. First, we really appreciate the state investment last biennium in the Quiet Sound program, and we would encourage renewed funding in the upcoming biennium. This state program reduces vessel noise impacts um, on southern resident killer whales. The Seaport Alliance is one of other financial contributors to the Quiet Sound program, and we would ask that budget writers uh, continue the state portion of funding to this important environmental initiative. Uh, Secondly, we agree with Isaac and support the governor's proposed $6.3 million appropriation for the Seaport Alliance's zero emission truck demonstration project found on page 41 of the budget. Uh, our hope is that this uh, demonstration project would inform a more thoughtful long-term statewide program into the future. We ask for your support in keeping this program. And again, thank you for the chance to testify tonight. Thank you for joining us online. Tom Salzer. All right, good evening, Chair Office and members of the committee. My name is Tom Salzer, and I'm here in support of the 2023-25 operating budget proposed in Senate Bill 5187. As Executive Director of the Washington Association of Conservation Districts, I'm honored to represent all 45 districts in Washington State. WACD strongly supports proposed funding for the Conservation Commission and all voluntary conservation programs your support is crucial in helping conservation districts put more conservation on the ground. For example, 
Without conservation technical assistance, districts would be unable to marry individual landowner needs with the state's priorities. Washington's conservation districts look forward to your continued support of voluntary conservation programs that ultimately benefit all Washingtonians, and we thank you. Very good, thank you, Tom. And last in this category of natural resources is Samantha. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. My name is Samantha Brueger and I am the Executive Director of Washington Wildlife First. We want to thank the governor and his staff for their work on the governor's budget. And we're grateful for the inclusion of riparian area restoration and education within that budget. However, we were disappointed that the governor did not include the $47.6 million in biodiversity funding requested by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We believe this funding is essential to ensure the department prioritizes protecting our fish and wildlife from the dual crises of biodiversity and climate change. We hope that you will include it in your budget. We are also working on two funding requests to support the important work of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. The first is a request of $150,000, which would allow the commission to contract with outside experts on important issues that the commission identifies would benefit from third-party scientific review. The second is a one-time request for funding for the Washington Institute of Public Policy to generate a report reviewing the governance structure and mandate of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mm -hmm. Washington Institute of Public Policy would also review issues related to equity, transparency, funding, and public accountability. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you on these requests. Thank you very much, Samantha. We are now going to move into a category called All Other. <laughs> and um, in person, is I have Jim Bamberger on my list in person. Then on remote, so Jim, if you could come forward on remote, please get ready to testify Brad Forbes. If I don't know, we just heard from you, so I don't know if you're going again. Aaron Shea McCann, um, Josephine Tamayo Murray, Oops. and Harold Hillseth. Jim, welcome to our meeting. Thank you, Senator Rolfus, uh, Senator Wilson, members of the committee, Jim Bamberger. I'm the director of the Office of Civil Legal Aid. I'll be very short and, and please allow me to be clear. The Office of Civil Legal Aid is requesting no new funding for new programs. Our focus this session and this biennium is on four points. One, we want to ensure our ability to meet statutory mandates in the appointed council programs for indigent tenants, for children who are dependent. We want to maintain currently legislatively, current legislatively authorized levels of general civil legal aid service. We want to ensure continued capacity to serve people entitled to civil relief under State v. Blake and tenants threatened with eviction but unable to or not yet ready for uh, appointed counsel program because they haven't been sued. And then finally, to address significant compensation gaps that threaten our ability to recruit and retain attorneys for children's representation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Erin, are you ready? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and committee members. My name is Erin Shea McCann. I'm the Director of Policy and Systemic Advocacy at Legal Counsel for Youth and Children. In 2021, the legislature passed House Bill 1219, which directs the Office of Civil Legal Aid to implement the Children's Representation Program statewide over the next several years. The program will provide foster youth with highly trained attorneys in the complex legal proceedings following a child's removal from their family. Please support OCLA's request for continued rollout of the program. In particular, we urge you to retain OCLA's request for a vendor rate increase for the attorneys it contracts with to represent youth. The current rate is not comparable to funding for other legal representation programs in the same court system like the Attorney General's Office representing the Child Welfare Agency. Nor does the rate cover the full cost of services provided, effectively sending the message that foster youth are undeserving of representation that is as, as well funded as other programs. The rate will not attract and retain diverse, skilled, and committed attorneys. Youth of color and LGBTQ plus youth are overrepresented in the child welfare system and Oakland, the Oakland needs adequate funding to offer robust and competitive contracts so that its attorneys are reflective of the children they are representing. Thank you so much and please support Oakland's requests. Thank you, Erin. Next up is Harold Hillsteth. 
I'm sorry, Chair Rolf, is, Herald is not here, but I'm here, Josephine. Ah, okay, please go ahead. Welcome. The, thank you, Chair Rolfes. Good evening, uh, Ranking Member Wilson and members of the committee. Josephine Tamayo Murray with the Communities of Concern Commission and Catholic Community Services in support of 5187 and the governor's budget. The Communities of Concern Commission is a statewide coalition of 24 community-based organizations of color and poor rural areas. While 5187 funds many good efforts, we ask that $500,000 go to the Communities of Concern Commission to help community-based organizations who have not historically been funded better compete and secure project funds. This past year, with your support, the commission had seven capital projects, either fully funded, have a groundbreaking, in construction, rent up, open for services, and expand operations. The commission really appreciates your confidence in us and community-based organizations to build and preserve self-determined capital assets in our respective communities to reduce poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Next. Next on the roster is Jorge Baron, Ana Nepomucino, Eli Goss, Ken Roski, remote, and then Melissa Johnson. Are you coming back up? Okay, so let's go to Jorge. Senator Rolfes and members of the committee. My name is Jorge Baron, and I'm the executive director of Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, and I'm here to speak on two important issues. First, we're asking you to increase the state's investment in three critical programs that support the provision of immigration and naturalization services, the Washington New Americans program, the DSHS naturalization program, and the legal support and community safety program in the Department of Commerce. We appreciate that the governor's budget does provide funding for these programs. However, each of these programs serves only a fraction of the people who need assistance, and the demand for these services has grown significantly in the past two years, as our state has welcomed thousands of new residents fleeing conflict and persecution in Afghanistan, Ukraine, and many other regions around the world. Last year, recognizing this growing need, you and the legislature added $2 million in additional funding to support these urgent efforts. We were disappointed that the governor's proposed budget did not include the continuation of this additional funding at a time when the need continues to grow. We're therefore asking you to continue the funding you added last year and further increase investments for each of these programs, and we'll provide the details in writing. And lastly, I want to express our organization's support for the additional call for funding presented by the Washington State Coalition of Domestic Violence uh, regarding services from crime victims. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, while we're waiting for Anna, we will oh, go to- I'm here. Oh. Let's see if we can find you. What do you think, Dana? Um, I'm on the panel. There you are. Yeah. I see you. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair, Chair Rolf and committee members. I'm Anna Nepomuceno, Public Policy Director for NAMI Washington. I wanna thank the governor for his continued investments in behavioral health. Specifically, I wanna call out the $106 million investment in the behavioral health workforce and the 7% reimbursement rate increase. The feedback we receive from our members is that there's simply not enough behavioral health providers to meet the growing needs in our state. These investments will increase the workforce, allowing better access to care. I also want to thank Governor Inslee for the proposed $190 million investment to increase bed capacity to community-based treatment centers, the University of Washington Behavioral Health Teaching Hospital, and forensic beds at Western Hospital. We look forward to continuing to work with you on a budget that meets the behavioral health care needs of Washington. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about the rough entry. Did great. Thank you. Thanks. Eli Goss. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. My name is Eli Goss, uh, One America Policy Director here in support of both everything Jorge Barone mentioned, um, as well as uh, to speak in particular about the New Americans program. We appreciate the governor including the base funding in the budget at 2 million, but we respectfully request additional funding to a total of $4.25 million in the next biennium. 
Our reasons include increased cost of programming due to inflation, ensuring competitive living wages for our over 10 organizational grantees across the state and staff, and developing legal capacity to serve more applicants. The need is high. There's an estimated 263,000 legal permanent residents eligible for citizenship in Washington state, but we know eligibility does not mean access. In the last two years alone, the network has responded to over 17,000 inquiries. We've completed over 3,300 client intakes, 2,000 naturalization applications, and of those, we're proud to say 750 clients have become citizens here in Washington, and we look forward to working together to expand that capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. Good evening again. My name is Melissa Johnson, speaking on behalf of the District and Municipal Court Judges Association in support of the governor's budget's investments in courts of limited jurisdiction. Uh, first, we support the budget's $21 million ongoing investment in therapeutic courts. Over the last two years, the legislature has invested $9 million in existing and new therapeutic courts, and we want to continue this important investment into the future. There's a need for both startup costs associated with new programs and maintaining existing programs, and therapeutic courts will be best served by a source of ongoing funds. We also support, support the funding for what's called the Fair Court Project. This uh, uses anonymous observers to assess how well procedural justice practices are incorporated throughout a courthouse. Um, the budget includes uh, funding to uh, have this pro project at 12 to 15 courts of limited jurisdiction across the state. Uh, there's also an education component built into this to bring findings from these projects to uh, all uh, courts of limited jurisdiction across the state. And finally, we support the $2.2 million investment in the case management system integration platform. This platform will allow courts to use third-party software to meet their unique needs. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on um, online is Ken Roski and then Mary Ellen Stone. Uh, Rogel Guillermo, Candice Bach, and Alexandra Olins. So Ken, please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, thank you. I'm Ken Roski, Chief of Police for the City of Pasco. I'm testifying in support of the appropriations <laughs> to establish a new regional law enforcement training academy in Pasco. Due to a high attrition rate, our state is experiencing a tremendous backlog of new recruits waiting to get into the police academy. The addition of regional police academies will immediately help provide relief in that area. Regional academies will expand our candidates pool of, of qualified recruits. We know that many uh, can't, individuals don't have the ability to relocate and, and live in a live-in academy for almost five months. And specifically for Pasco and the agricultural community we appreciate this challenge is often too much of a burden for, for those viable candidates to just leave for five months. Additionally, uh, a long-term, the Regional Police Academy concept will allow an opportunity to increase the instructor pool that we have now from around the state. We appreciate your consideration and thank you for, their, uh, uh, for letting me testify this evening. Thank you for joining us. Mary Ellen Stone. Uh, Chair Rolfus, committee members, thank you so much. And I have to say, you all must be tired. Um, a couple things. We, uh, I'm representing King County Sexual Assault Resource Center and an unprecedented coalition of organizations serving uh, crime victims, le civil legal services, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. We are disappointed that we are not included in the budget for additional, serv uh, additional funding. Crime victims, your constituents rely on our services um, across the state, and we are now facing double-digit increases in demand, the pandemic and mental health related, coupled with potentially 25% reductions in current funding levels. The Victims of Crime Act funding has been declining and is completely flattening out. We are asking for your support to put $132 million into the budget for the biennium because crime victims shouldn't have to rely on unstable federal funding, that that's more responsibility of the state. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Rochelle, welcome. Chair Rolfus and members of the Ways and Means Committee, my name is Guillermo Rogel and I'm the legislative advocate with Front and Center. 
<laughs> it's okay, Senator Robles. <laughs> uh, our members are eager to work with you as we build a state budget that adequately invests in our needs of our overburdened communities and centers environmental justice. You're going to be hearing those two phrases a lot this session, overburdened communities and environmental justice. We need to make sure that those are matched with practice and actual high level of community accountability. There's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to be invested this session, and we want to make sure that as, as you all are creating this budget, you are centering communities that are facing the effects of climate change first and worst. Um, we are testifying as other today because it, it is unclear in the governor's budget how they are actually meeting the obligations under the Healthy Environment for All Act. We specifically would like to see funding and community participatory planning. This is actually getting community members involved in the budgeting process so that we're not consulting community members after the fact, after budgets have been created. We wanna make sure that we're also investing in public transportation that's frequent, affordable, and accessible, um, as well as climate resiliency to support our workers as they're facing the effects of climate change. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to working with you as we build a budget this session. Thank you. Great, thank you. Candace, are you here? I don't see Candace Bach. We'll go to Alexandra Owens. Good evening, Chair Rolfes. Um, I'm Alexandra Olins, and I'm the Director of Employment and Citizenship Programs at Asian Counseling and Referral Service in Seattle. Uh, ACRS is the largest naturalization service provider in the state of Washington. Each year we complete about six to 700 naturalization applications on behalf of our clients, and we offer five classes per quarter in multiple languages. We are a small but mighty naturalization program with eight staff and one AmeriCorps volunteer. So I'm testifying tonight in support of additional funding for DSHS for immigration and naturalization services. ACRS's program is entirely funded by contracts and grants. And every year our program runs a deficit. We're supported by other programs, but I cannot hire any additional staff unless I have additional funding. I currently have a half-time employee who is Russian and speaks Ukrainian. You can imagine how much I would like to make her a full-time staff. I have a wonderful AmeriCorps who speaks Vietnamese as her native language. And she has indicated to us that she would like to stay on as a full-time staff person. Without additional funding, we cannot hire anybody else. And we know there's so much unmet, unmet need for naturalization assistance in the state of Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up on the line, we are missing a few people. Um, Brittany Gregory, are you with us? I am here. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Ralphus, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brittany Gregory, Associate Director of Judicial Legislative Relations here at the Ministry of Office of the Courts. Um, I just want to say we're here today to speak in support of the governor's budget and also just to say thank you. The legislature um, gave us a lot of funding to not only uh, create new therapeutic court programs in the CLJs, but also address a lot of the staffing and retention issues that we were having over here at AOC. So thank you for partnering with us in those. Chris Stanley, my colleague, will focus on some of our main priorities, but I quickly want to talk about the data for justice package. The items in this package um, are really needed to ensure that we are moving towards equitable justice. It's about $3.3 million and will enable AOC and the Washington Center for State Court Research to work directly with local courts to use their data to examine and improve court performance and outcomes. I really quickly wanted to highlight that this package includes funding for the judicial needs estimation, which is how the courts know when additional officers or judicial, judicial staff is needed and how we know to let you guys know that, that those, those things are needed. So very important for the courts and very important for the legislature. So thank you for your time and you all know how to get a hold of me and I'm happy to answer questions over email. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I was told that Christopher Stanley isn't here, but let's give him another chance. Are you here, Christopher? I'm, I'm here, Senator Rolfus. Oh, good. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. Good evening. I would like to start my remarks by thanking you profusely for your historic investment in our court system last session. Much of our request this year revolves around continuing the good work that you started to fund last year. A lot of those investments were one time and... Um, and, and we wanted to keep a lot of that going, such as therapeutic courts, the Blake implementation team, our family treatment court team, among others. Before I go further, I, should, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Christopher Stanley. I'm the chief financial and management officer at the administrative office of the courts. One of our uh, second priorities revolves around court security. 
We heard loud and clear last year that there wasn't a lot of interest in fully funding at the state level court security. So we came back with a matching grant program aimed at small and rural court systems. And we're hoping uh, to talk to you more about that individually, about the structure that we've developed to award those funds. And finally, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but I wanna mention the JIS account. It's how we fund the entire IT infrastructure of most of our court system. And it's funded solely with traffic fines and fees, and it, uh, it has taken a hit on revenue. Traffic fines and fees are down 50%, and we wanna continue working with you and your staff closely to come up with a permanent solution to, the, to, to that revenue problem in the account. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Next is um, Sophia Bird McSherry. Are you here? And Mark Johnson. And while we're waiting for those guys to come up, I'm going to call on Mike Battis online. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Battis. I'm the uh, president of the Washington Ambulance Association. And we're signing in pro for the HC budget request to increase uh, ground ambulance transportation funding. We haven't seen an increase in funding since 2004 from the state of Washington. As you can imagine, things have uh, gone up a little bit in the cost of doing business. Uh, the most vulnerable citizens in our, in our state rely on ambulance services. They rely on the Medicaid system to provide those services. And without this much needed relief, uh, we're putting those citizens at risk. Uh, it's almost a, uh, a daily occurrence that we do not uh, get full reimbursement for the, the services that we provide. And that's a losing system. There's major ambulance agencies in the state of Washington that have had to pull out of the state of Washington due to dismal rates. This doesn't fix all the problems, but it goes a heck of a long ways. And it's the biggest step we've seen in almost two decades. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here in person. Um, and I'm here with the State Office of Public Defense. I'm Sophia Bird McSherry, the Deputy Director, testifying in support of the governor's proposed biennial budget, which funds OPD's agency operations, client services, grants to local governments, and other pass-through funding. This includes uh, the, the critically important funding that, that you've provided uh, in this current biennium for Blake resentencing. A couple of highlights that I wanna to touch on include $6.7 million for uh, uh, to begin a four-year process to increase contract fees for more than 200 contract at attorneys who represent parents in dependency cases, persons in indigent appeals, persons facing civil commitment under Chapter 7109. Uh, most of you know that that group uh, uh, that that group of attorneys that we work with, um, and. What we've been seeing is about a 22% turnover rate statewide among those attorneys with substantially higher turnover rates in some counties. Uh, Chelan County is over 50%, Spokane County is over 50%, Snohomish County is about 40%. So it's it's uh, getting worse. Benton Franklin County, I think is about 28%. Um, we also have an issue with our contracted attorneys not receiving the same resources and support from the state as the state provides for assistant attorneys general. So an AAG who has to essentially prosecute a case is getting uh, about 40% more resources in terms of uh, funding that supports their salary benefits, all of their uh, office resources and including staffing. Our contracted attorneys have to pay all of that out of their contract fee. Second item that we're requesting, and I think you'll hear more about from another uh, testifier is uh, about 3.4 million to continue and expand funding that was initiated last year by Senator Robinson um, to provide pre-filing representation of parents before a dependency case is filed to help them not lose custody of their children, not, not get involved in a dependency and cause that burden on the state. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I'll just touch very briefly, we are asking for $10 million uh, to provide innovation grants for counties and cities so that they can implement best practices uh, for public defense and other improvements in, in their public defense services in their local criminal justice systems. Thank you very much. Um, I, I ask that these items would be continued 
or included in your final budget along with the other operating costs for the office. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Mark Johnson, representing the Washington Retail Association here today to support the governor's proposal to fund the organized retail crime task force within the attorney general's office at $2.2 million. We would encourage the committee to consider increasing it to the full request of the AG to $3 million. Organized retail crime is a huge growing problem. It's getting more and more dangerous and more and more costly. Just last year, my members lost about $2.7 billion, and these are becoming very violent towards our customers, towards our employees, and to our owners. So we encourage the committee to include that funding in your budget. Thank you very much. Next up remote, is Brian Hatfield here? Okay, Brian, why don't you head up and we'll see if Dr. Scott Phillips is ready. After Scott online will be Debbie Maloney and then Adam Ball out. So Scott, are you available? I'm here, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Office and members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, my name is uh, Dr. Scott Phillips. I live on Vashon Island and I'm the Executive and Medical Director of the Washington Poison Center. I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 5188 and 5187. And I want to thank the governor for including in the budget. The Poison Center is in our 67th year as a nonprofit written into legislation in 1993, helping the public and medical providers alike. And we do a lot more than just help children and pass out Mr. Yuck stickers. Many of our patients are in the mental health or substance use crisis, and the Poison Center has a direct impact and focus on their care. In 2021, 40% of our adolescent patients called us because they've taken a substance for self-harm or suspected suicide reasons. Children calling for help, really imagine that for a moment. And we're seeing more of these, youth calling the Poison Center for help before they tell a parent or a caregiver. We seem to be the first call they make, and fortunately they call us. We've seen a dramatic rise in fentanyl, of course, and other abused substances that are emerging within the state, uh, even as recent as today. Uh, that often require expertise and our team of uh, medical providers to help manage those overdoses. But when a worried person calls us first, we're able to keep them at home and um, about 90% of those cases. And that saves the healthcare budget about $40 million annually in the state of Washington, roughly 10 times our budget. So it's not cheap to maintain this service. And we're asking to restore uh, our funding back to at least 2008 levels, and that's what the governor's budget do. And I urge you to vote in favor of 5188 and 5187. And I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak and offer to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you, Chair Rolfus and committee members. I am Brian Hatfield, Legislative Director for the Office of Secretary of State Steve Hobbs. Like most people here this evening, we say to the governor, thank you, but <laughs> with the majority of our but uh, being requests for much needed IT upgrades that are long overdue. Um, in the interest of time and saving paper, you should have received an electronic copy of our request summary to replace the combined fund drives obsolete financial management technology. In addition to this request for $3,391,000, uh, we have roughly 1.7 million in office-wide IT requests and a handful of smaller requests that we will continue to work with you and your staff on throughout the budget process. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next is Debbie Maloney online. Hello. 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 Chairwoman Walsh and, thank, and committee members, thank you for allowing me to participate in this hearing. I'm here today to ask that you do not fund the $600,000 requested by Washington State Parks and Recreation Department for the development plans at Miller Peninsula State Park. Miller Peninsula State Park is a 3,000 acre second and old growth forested area. Its forests, wildlife, wetlands, and coastal environments are intact and provide a necessary carbon sink on the Olympic Peninsula. State Parks is using 20-year-old plans for their development proposals. Their plans are inadequate in any, with any specificity regarding the aquifer, fire, traffic, habitat destruction considerations. Their plans, oh no, I'm gonna add. 
Their plans do not reflect any current scientific thinking around climate changing issues, which we are all facing. They must include a fourth planning option in the natural forest area that reflects the conditions of our ever changing climate. I urge you not to fund the state parks budget request for Miller Peninsula State Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Debbie. Thank you. We next have a panel of people that signed in from the first clinic, but I think that the only person um, who's going to testify is Gina Wassam Miller. So Gina, if any other members of your team are here, let me know, but you are the first one up. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I apologize, but my team did have issues with Zoom. So I will be testifying for myself and Adam Balut. I do have Jennifer Justice with me in person. Is she able to testify after me on this link? Oh, that's a great way to solve that problem. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. My name is Gina Wassamiller from the First Legal Clinic. I am testifying in support of the governor's budget. First stands for Family Intervention Response to Stop Trauma. The trauma being unnecessary separation of newborns from their mothers at birth. At first, we provide legal representation and support families in crisis. We address safety concerns before they escalate to court involvement. We do this by offering a skilled child welfare attorney to the parents before they, their child is born. Then we connect them with parents with lived experience. We connect them to the people they know what they are going through that understands the fear and distrust of systems, the shame of using substances while pregnant and past trauma of having a child removed. As I sit in front of you today, as the first clinic parent ally, you no longer see a mother who is homeless in active addiction, hiding from the reality of drugs. You no longer see a mother living in shame and guilt. As the parent ally with the First Legal Clinic, I am the person I wish I had in my personal journey. I meet the moms we work with in one of their most vulnerable moments. I share my experience, strength, and hope to establish a safe place for them to open up. When they share what they need, I instantly start the work of getting those resources set up for the family. It could be a drug and alcohol assessment or treatment resources transportation to a six month inpatient program. My experience in the role of the first clinic has been the most reward for me. By you supporting the first clinic, you're being a part of the solution in reducing trauma, ensuring that families do not enter the court system and are not separated from their newborns. This change changes and lives in our state with your support of the governor's budget, our clinic will be funded and we will be able to expand on the work that we are doing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gina. And, and I think we're going to hear from Jennifer. You are. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Hey, Jennifer, lower yourself a little bit. Sit down. Relax. Welcome. <laughs> there you go. Is that better? Yep. All right. I'm going to go down. Okay. There we go. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Justice and I'm a parent ally with the first clinic. In 2017, I became involved with the child welfare system. During my involvement, I had between four to six caseworkers and just as many as attorneys. I was scared and alone. The lack of stability and support ended up in a 3,120 day dependency case that ended with a judge telling me love was just not enough and my rights were terminated. <laughs> Losing my children was the most traumatic experience of my life. And again, in 2020, again, I became involved with the child welfare system. I was scared and untrusting, but I received a referral to the first clinic and it changed my life. For the first time, I had a voice. People who cared about me as a person and a mother. The first clinic not only provided me with support, but taught me how to advocate for myself, providing me with the skills and resources to sustain, to, sustain, to help me as a mother to keep my family together. With their help, my involvement with the child welfare system lasted 180 days and was trauma-free. The first clinic was not only there for me during the scariest and hardest times of my life, but also during the best part of my life, my future. Now, a little over two and a half years later, I'm a parent ally with the first clinic. And I have the gift of providing 
the same judgment-free support to other mothers who are also facing having their newborns removed from their care. I guide these mothers during very fragile times and watch them come out on the other side with their children, confident, shame-free, and full of happiness. The First Clinic is an upstream care that all mothers deserve, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the First Legal Clinic coming to join us? Unfortunately, um, their links didn't work. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Great. You two did a great job. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. Next up is Joe Beck told Claire Olivers and Sarah Beth uh, Huat. Joe? Hello and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joe Bechtold and I am the Public Policy Manager for the Mockingbird Society. We're glad to see the generous investments in housing and homelessness in the governor's budget. We're glad to see that all of our funding for Mockingbird families was in the budget, including the portions related to the DCYF DS settlement decision package. We're so pleased that the governor has recognized the success of the statewide Mockingbird family model. Mockingbird family brings foster homes together around a centralized experienced caregiver to provide necessary supports for both foster youth and parents. We're excited to see the full $4.5 million for Mockingbird family investments and hope the Senate and House budget reflect the same investment. We also encourage lawmakers to make investments into extended foster care program, including an increase in SIL payments from $850 a month to $1,200 a month to ensure that young adults do not exit into homelessness and ensuring a nurturing home for foster youth. It is our belief that these children are crucial for meeting the needs of youth and young adults in the child welfare system. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Claire? Chair of office and uh, committee members, uh, my name is Claire Olivers. I'm the president of the Retired Public Employees Council of Washington, and thank you for working such long hours today. Um, we're very grateful to see funding in Senate Bill 5187 for a one-time COLA for our PERS and TERS Plan 1 retirees, uh, the oldest and um, long, in most cases, longest retired um, state and local employees. The, uh, that uh, funding supports a 3% uh, COLA capped at $110 per month as recommended by the Select Committee on Pension Policy. And uh, we are eager to see you keep that funding in whatever budget uh, comes out the other end of the long process of putting a budget together and modifying it and redrafting. As you know, uh, very few of the Plan 1 um, retirees have a recurring COLA, and it's these uh, occasional ad hoc COLAs that keep them uh, afloat. So thank you in these inflationary times for keeping that money in the budget. Thank you, Claire. Next is Sarah Beth. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Beth Hernandez Hewitt. I've been a practicing attorney since 2007 and have been contracting with the Office of Civil Legal Aid for almost a decade. I'm strongly in favor of OCLA's compensation adjustment for child representation attorneys. We are substantially underpaid for the valuable service we provide our clients. None of us do this for the money. We love this job and the tangible and real differences we make for our clients and the support of OCLA's training and membership but the current compensation rate is insufficient. It does not adequately cover our costs. It does not support recruitment and retention of high quality dedicated attorneys. Absent a compensation increase, the child representation program will face unacceptable rates of turnover, which hurts already distressed foster youth. Children and dependencies are already marginalized and deserve the highest quality of representation to advocate for them and give them a voice in the legal proceedings that may affect them for the rest of their lives. I thank you. Thank you. We are now gonna go, I have four people signed in who said they were gonna testify in person and I should have called them up earlier. Um, Greg Link, Jason Schwartz, Anthony Powers and Laura Zarawaski, come on up. And while they're coming up, they're not, it's not the end though. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for sticking with us. We have two people online, um, Alexandra Deese and Cesar Torres. Alexandra? Thank you, Chair Office and members of the committee. 
I'm Alexander Diaz with the Equal Justice Coalition, representing civil legal aid providers, stakeholders, and clients from around the state. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of the funding provided to the Office of Civil Legal Aid and Senate Bill 5187. Particularly important is OCLA's appropriation for basic civil legal aid services, including a vendor rate adjustment to protect existing client service delivery capacity at the Northwest Justice Project and subcontracted volunteer attorney and specialty legal aid providers. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, civil legal aid providers have experienced a significant increase in demand for civil legal assistance across the state while simultaneously struggling to maintain the capacity to provide these services in a time of high inflation. This appropriation is essential to ensure continuity of collective capability to maintain the capacity to provide these services. The civil legal aid community is committed to achieving justice for all, and we are very grateful for the legislature's strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Cesar? Thank you very much, uh, Chair Office and committee members. Uh, I am Cesar Torres, Executive Director of the Northwest Justice Project, the statewide provider of free civil legal aid services to low income families and individuals. To I'm here in support of the Office of Legal Aid requested appropriation in the governor's budget, and specifically in support for maintaining the existing basic civil legal aid service capacity through the vendor rate adjustment. Maintaining basic legal, legal aid service capacity is essential to the safety and well-being of thousands of people in poverty who each year are forced to turn to the judicial system to protect themselves and their families. Among the many legal problems basic civil legal aid addresses are domestic violence, medical debt, access to healthcare, unlawful debt collection, foreclosure, homelessness, and employer and landlord abuse. Maintaining access to legal assistance and representation is also crucial to vindicating the many important rights and protections enacted by the legislature. We do this through our toll-free hotline and 21 office locations serving clients across the state. Thank you for your support to maintain basic civil legal aid client service capacity in this session. And thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for joining us patiently. All right, All right. thank you. Maybe our last panel, so wow us quickly. <laughs> good, good evening, um, Madam Chair and um, uh, ranking member and members of the committee. My name is Greg Link. I'm the director of the Washington Appellate Project. It's a, a statewide office of appellate public defenders uh, representing individuals in every county in this state. Uh, I'm here tonight to, to speak uh, with my appreciation for the governor's in, uh, inclusion of the budget for the Office of Public Defense in its budget, but uh, as you've heard from others, it's not quite enough. Uh, that budget contemplates if, uh, uh, as it's part of a four-year implementation cycle, and I challenge this, uh, the, to you to, to try to close uh, that gap in two years. Uh, the attorneys in my office, we appear in courts across the state, and every time we appear, uh, we know we're fighting for the rights of a fair justice system for our clients. But we also know that our opponent across the aisle in every case is making more money and is better resourced than us. Uh, it presents a significant problem in my ability to recruit and retain qualified attorneys uh, that have been champions and at the forefront of, of doing things such as a, a attacking a crippling legal financial aid, uh, excuse me, legal financial obligations, uh, pushing back against uh, racially uh, disparate sentencing outcomes. Um, so I ask you uh, to attempt to close that gap in two years and not the four years that the state asks uh, that the governor's uh, budget contemplates. Thank you. Th thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Jason Shores. I'm the director of the Snohomish County Office of Public Defense. I'm also the chair of the Washington State Bar Association Council on Public Defense. And I'm also here today in support of OPD's, uh, the governor's budget uh, relating to the Office of Public Defense. I believe the Council on Public Defense has written a letter in support of OPD's budget and you should have that as well. I wanna talk to you about Katrina and Christopher who are two Snohomish County residents. Both were convicted of a felony crime. Both appealed their crime and were represented by Greg's office. Both received justice when their convictions were reversed and they were released. The justice was remedied for both Katrina and Chris, but not for their counsel. Their counsel were making significantly less than both of their opponents in the courtroom. It's making, that makes a statement to Katrina and Chris about really the value of their services in the eyes of those who fund those services 
services and provide those services. And, and we don't want to leave that message with those impacted uh, by the legal system, particularly with unconstitutional convictions. So I ask that you fully fund uh, the vendor increase. It impacts the vendors like those in the first legal clinic, who you heard already, who make a big impact in the community. Their work is also going to be supported by the State Office of Public Defense's improvement grants, which is a new line item in their budget. I encourage you to support that. It will provide a lot of innovation and efficiency in the long run if it's let to go forward. I lastly want to say to all of you, I encourage you to support OPD's budget uh, for the Blake program. And I say this specifically because it's not the Blake stuff that we've been hearing in the news, what's going forward. It's the retroactive Blake work. All those folks who have convictions, senses that need to be vacated, or fines that they owed. There's some very hardworking public defenders at the State Office of Public Defense who are working on that and they need continued support and finances for that support. So I please, I ask you to, incur, uh, to support their budget uh, going forward so that we can get justice for Katrina, Chris, and Greg. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Anthony and Lara, are you speaking? Okay. Good evening, Chair Rolfus and members of the committee. For the record, Lara Zareski, I'm the Executive and Policy Director for the Washington Innocence Project. We um, are an independent nonprofit that works all across the state of Washington and all 39 counties, representing people with viable claims of actual innocence that we prove through DNA or any other kind of newly discovered evidence. Um, I'm actually here in support very much of the governor's budget and especially of the vendor rate increase that was just mentioned. Um, and that is a, sort of a, an indirect important issue for us. We are not funded in any way by state funds. We're not in the budget. We've never been in the budget. <laughs> but at the same time, what we work on is cases of actual innocence where people were wrongly convicted after going through the entire system, including the appeals process. We don't even pick up a case or even look at it until the entire appeals process is final and has failed. Um, it is impossible to quantify the human cost of a wrongful conviction, not just the person that was involved, but their families, their entire communities. But what is possible to quantify is the cost of public safety and to local and state budgets when the wrong person is convicted. It is incredibly important and truly, you know, and a lot of people on this committee um, have heard me talk ad nauseum about all the different changes we need to make to prevent wrongful convictions in this state. We need to make them and we can, but most immediately right now, the single most important thing that we can do to prevent these injustices is a well-funded and stable defense. So I'd highly encourage you please to at minimum fund um, the vendor increase at the amount that's in the governor's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, honorable members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me. It's been a long day. <laughs> I can't imagine having your jobs. Um, I'm here to support the governor's budget and um, in particular, uh, the Office of Public Defense. Um, they have uh, funded the Blake for a pilot program called the Redemption Project of Washington. So the Redemption Project of Washington is focused on post-conviction relief. And with a lot of a lot of the cases that are coming out, just we're working with the Department of Corrections and within two months of putting the notice out of some of the cases that were uh, to see if people were ex eligible, we had over, almost a thousand responses from the Department of Corrections. So you can only imagine with capacity issues and lack of funding for defend defense attorneys. So we screen those cases and uh, try to have a central hub so that people don't have to keep on trying to re reinvent the wheel and it's gonna even lead to more money. So we support that and we support the leadership of Larry Jefferson who was focused on equity and uh, uh, the recognition of both legal practitioners and the clients that they serve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members of the committee, that concludes our public hearing on the governor's budget. Thank you all um, who participated and um, hung with us for this. This was a long uh, meeting that was actually directed at the public. Thank you, committee members. Also, those of you who are still here for the time. And thank you, staff, um, for sticking with us and staying awake and doing all of that. Yeah. That will conclude our January 10th meeting of the Ways and Means Committee. Welcome. Wait. Yeah.
All right. Looks like we made it through. That was good. Uh, we will be back here tomorrow uh, to testify again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. As you can see, it's really easy to do. You know, wasn't much to it. Got a minute. Practice what you're going to say because a minute goes fast. I went over by about 20 seconds. <clears throat> I did notice a few people went over. So you do want to be respectful. Um, but I really couldn't get it under 60 seconds. So you just got to be careful with that uh, and do what you can. All right, y'all. I am R1 Cameron. This is The Conduit. Man, it's Monday night. It's a busy day. I don't know. It's, is it Monday or is it Tuesday? No, it's Tuesday, right? Oh, man. Where's the day going? It's the 10th already of January. Woo! Man, all right, y'all. See y'all later.